Code here now. Okay. Welcome everyone. Collective Minds episode eight. Today we have a special guest, John Allred. John's a custom painter of statues. Probably a lot of you are, are aware of his work. Um, just to go around the room to the panel, say who's here. We've got. Um, uh, we have, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I heard myself in the in the microphone. Uh, we've got Ryan, collector, sinister collector. Hey, it's gone. Statue Mania just stepped off camera, <laughs> and oh, you've got Archangel down in the lower corner there. What's going and on? There's, and there's John to Ark's left. Um, okay, so let's let's jump right into it. We started to chat a little bit before the show, and John, you were telling us about uh, the work that you do. I've got some pictures that I I stole from your Facebook page, and and we'll flip through those in just a bit. But oh, why don't you tell us why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got started in painting statues? Well, it kind of it was, you know convergence of a lot of different things at the same time. I started out um, painting, as I said before, Dungeons and Dragons figures in, eight, in 78. And that kind of transitioned into the garage kit, uh, kits in 87. And I started to get some work in the early 90s, uh, local work. And then when the internet came aboard, that was really the, it all kind of broke open after that. And um, at first, I was just painting garage kits for people. It was about 90%, you know, of that, and 10% repainting statues for collectors, you know, that collected early sideshow pieces and things like that. And then it kind of exploded. The statue thing exploded, and it flipped. And I, I do 90% custom, you know, statues, and about. 10% monsters and garage kits. So I just began with just being at the right place at the right time, the internet opening up. And uh, I had a uh, website. And then when I got on Facebook and I looked at it and I said, well, geez, you know, if I've got 50 friends and he's got 100 friends and so and so has 100 friends, you know, I could probably get much more work and uh, much more exposure here. So I closed the website in uh, I think 2000, I'm going to say 2007, does that sound about right when Facebook came around? Yeah, Six, 2006. it really started to pick up, yeah. And uh, it just skyrocketed, you know, it just exploded. And uh, at that time I was doing a lot of, uh, I was writing for a couple of magazines, I was teaching painting classes all over the country, so it just, like I said, it all just converged all at the same time, which was great for me. And John, how did you, like, how did you learn, like, I would think, like, you know, painting the uh, Dungeons and Dragons figures, like, kind of gives you a certain, I guess, taste for painting, but, like, how how do you get better and better? Do you learn through other people? Are there, like, Facebook videos, or well, like, yeah, YouTube then, videos? Back then, there weren't a lot of, I'm, I'm talking about pre-2000, there weren't a lot of oh, right. Good point. shows you could go to, or formats you could pull up on how to paint a figure. There, I don't know if you guys know who Shepard Payne is. He was one of the earliest uh, figure painters that was no, no, uh, known worldwide. And he had a couple of books that you could buy you know, on how to paint figures and things like that. But uh, it was pretty much trial and error. When I decided I wanted to do this for a living, I, this was about 2003, I went crazy and just painted everything I could get my hands on. And I've got about, you know, I wish I could pan with this camera, but I don't know how to do it really. But I've got four display cases here in the studio that have about 300 garage kits in them. And they're, they're all practice. They were all me practicing, getting better, you know, for about two and a half, three years. And that's all I did, you know. Every just about is it about like critiquing yourself and like yeah, I would think at some point like you reach a plateau and then you need to learn something from someone else and then you can kind of go on your own again. You know what I mean? Like does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And, and it's also once the show started springing up, like Monster Palooza and uh, oh wow, 
the Jersey Fest, and, uh, Wonder Fest, and Mask Fest, and all these festivals that they have all over. They started the magazines that uh, were garage kit magazines, started having painting classes for people that were painting, you know, uh, garage kits. So I got into some, I didn't take any of the classes, but by then I was able to teach them. Oh, wow. So, you know, so that really helped me personally up my standards. And when, when we moved into this house, I, I took the master bedroom as my studio, you know, and I, I, I'm putting a lot of work and a lot of money into this room. And I felt like, you know, if you're going to buy a Mercedes, you better learn how to drive it. That was my mantra. Right. If you're going to buy uh, put all this money into something and all your time, then you better really be good at it. So that's what I did. I, I practiced for about three years and then started getting commissions slowly. And, you know, it just took off from there. Did you have? Did you ever have moments when you were like starting to paint, like you would mess up and it would be like really frustrating? Like, what would you do when if that I, happened? Like when it happened? I would usually throw a piece across the room. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't. Do that, but I actually have done that sometimes. But no, I would. The great thing about this is I tell people you can always prime over it. You know, prime it again and start over. There's no. You don't have to finish it and go. Well, that's as good as I can do. That's true. Re reprime it and paint it again. And I did that many, many times. I mean, I started out doing hardware, you know, Star Trek and Star Wars vehicles and stuff like that. And when I was in college and just getting out of college, I, Star Wars had hit and it was special effects. And I thought I, I was going to go out to California and see if I could get any special effects. So I started tricking out all these Star Trek and Star Wars models with lighting and things like that. And, you know, I do one and I wouldn't like it, and I do the whole thing again. I, I do it two or three times till I was satisfied, you know, with what I was doing. Yeah. It just yeah. takes a lot of, it's like anything else. It takes a lot of practice, a lot of determination, and uh, you have to have the time for it, too. Um, one of the things that I really, um, Archangel was saying that he, uh, is that right? Did I say your name right? <laughs> Okay. That's correct. Uh, good enough. Okay. Because I'm also Jesus. No, it's. I really envy the guys that work full time, are raising children, and are painting. That's really difficult. You know, they've yeah, got, I've got you know, children. They're, yeah, they're juggling a uh, you know a diff, you know fifty plates at once, trying to maintain everything, and they still pull off great paint jobs. Um, yeah. I'm fortunate in the sense that I can focus on this every day and just do it. I don't have any kids. Um, I live with my girlfriend. She's into it. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing. When you have the time to work on something, uh, any hobby, you know, you're, so you get home. You have to spend a little time with the family. Give you maybe have, what, an hour, hour and a half to devote to the hobby. And within that half hour or hour and a half, you're going, where was I last week? Where did I, you know, what did I take on? You know, what did I start off or leave off? So I don't have any of that, that distraction. Not that I, it's distraction, but you know what I mean. I, I, can't tell you, I think I have those distractions. I'm pretty sure I send myself more emails than anybody else does for that same reason. Mm -hmm. of like trying to remember where I was with stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Because when I get home, the kids just pull me in a different direction. And that's right. so. you know, and, and that's your time with your family. You have to, you know, and you should want to do it. But uh, it, this hobby or any hobby like this is a very solitary hobby. It's you and the kit. It's you and the paint job. It's you and the studio. You can't really talk to anybody. You can't really, you know, you can't have a conversation while you're trying to concentrate on something that has, you know, a detail that's, you know, that small so so it's a, you know it's an interesting kind of solitary any kind of artwork like this is, is somewhat solitary and you have to have the right mindset for it like anything else oh sure <laughs> so, so when you were getting started um mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah i know you were saying that you started out with the garage kits and things like that 
did you uh, kind of have to reach out to people like, hey, you know, I'm I'm painting kits if interested, or was it more like you were practicing on them and people saw them and then it was kind of like word of mouth, you know, as you got, you know, better and better and more people yeah. were interested? I think it was a little of both. Um, mm -hmm. Having been, I had been in a, a lot of different jobs where I was uh, dealing with people and customer service and things like that. And had a lot of employees under me. And this all helped me. This is one thing that a lot of artists have difficulty with because they're so solitary and they're so, you know, involved in their creative uh, endeavors that they don't know how to run a business or, you know, communicate with people effectively about timelines and finishing things within a given time and scheduling and all those things that other people do normally. That's why musicians have managers and, you know, uh, artists show and art galleries because they can't handle all that stuff. It's very difficult to do. So I had that background. So when it came to the marketing, and there is a marketing aspect to any job, I really focused on perfecting the marketing aspect of it and getting myself out there in the right places and the right uh, websites on the right forums. You know, and uh, meeting people and talking to them and going to shows and doing all the things that you have to do to make any business successful. So I, I did the due diligence as far as that goes. And, uh, you know, um, it's worked. <laughs> so, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so that's just, you know, I, I guess that answered your question. Mm -hmm. so hey, and was, also, go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead, John. No, I was just going to say it was... It was also, um, there were a couple shows that I went to, and just like this, there were uh, websites where everybody was showing their work, and people started to know who I was, but that's only one thing, that's only one as small aspect of one website. That doesn't broaden your, your uh, palette of people that can come to your, uh, you know, give you jobs. So I went to this... Uh, show in Louisville, Kentucky, which is a big, Wonderfest is the biggest garage kit figure painting show in the country and one of the biggest ones in the world. People come from all over the world to enter this, these contests. So I went there and I knew a couple of people from talking to them on websites. And I bumped into one of the guys and I told him who, he wa who I was. And we were in the elevator and he literally stopped the elevator and he goes, you got to come back down to the bar and you got to meet everybody. <laughs> and it was one of those great being at the right place, right time moments. And he took me back in the bar and, and introduced me to all these great painters that I had uh, worshipped for years in different magazines. And that was my in, you know, into the, the, the belly of the beast as opposed mm -hmm. to being on the outside looking at it. Are you able to, to, to keep in contact with them? Well, I, yeah, I've known all these guys for Oh, like, that's so years. cool. You know, I know a lot of people that work at Sideshow and a lot of the painters and you know, a couple of them are really good friends of mine. So, you know, That's it's, so cool. it's been great. And, and you will see, if you look at the history of garage kits and, and special effects and all of this, all of these guys were at the right place at the right time again. They were in California. They were in hobby shops in California. Sideshow started making statues instead of action figures and lame, you know, statues that they started out with. And these guys were you know, kind of procur procured from those environments and like Tom Glillen and, you know, Steve Wang and Casey Love and people like that. These are all guys that are at the top of their game now, but they all right. started, you know, painting models in their, in their basement. So it's, it's that same, it's that same kind of connection all the way through. You mentioned, you mentioned uh, Sideshow. Does, the, does most of the work that you do now for the private collector, or are you also doing some contract work for Sideshow or the other big guys, or even these these smaller guys that do custom statues? I've done many prototypes over the years. I did quite a few for garage kit, garage kit manufacturers back in the day. And then um, I, I tried to keep doing that, but the the thing that I don't like about, two things that I don't like about production pieces like that is that that is painting by committee. Oh, yeah. 
that is not your spin on something. You know, I mean, there's there's like, too much there's too much outside uh, opinions essentially. Well, yeah, you know, it's it's if you're painting a piece for slideshow, there's a committee of people looking at that and making changes. And even after you paint it, this and this is if you're outside the you're a freelance painter for them. Uh, they may still make adjustments and changes in your paint job. And to me, that that wasn't very attractive as far right. as you know, on a personal on a personal level only. I understand how it works. I worked for uh, a couple of years for Hollywood Collectibles, small company. I did oh, okay. prototypes for them for a couple of years, and uh, you know they were they had some really nice uh, uh, properties. They had some high end properties, um, but they were a small company and. You know, they were still trying to grow. But I took that job to learn about how to paint for, a, you know, a production piece, how to paint a production piece. And it was real enlightening, you know, and I, I wouldn't want to do it full time because it's when the piece is ready, you know, when it gets cast and it gets molded and it's ready to go, you have to drop everything and you have to paint it because they're on a schedule to get this thing out to the public to sell. You know, there's a there's a whole front end, back end, you know, it's like pre-production, production, post-production post -production on these things. And everybody's waiting for their, to do their bit. So when it's ready and it drops, you got to drop everything. And by that time, I had had a lot of personal clients. I already built a clientele. And, you know, I'd have to literally, they were telling me, you know, you have to do it now. So I'd have to stop a job or drop a job and tell this guy, you got to wait. I didn't like doing that to clients, so I didn't think it was fair. So, and it's always been like this. Even the last couple ones I've done for the private, the small, you know, collectible companies, uh, same thing. So, I don't do it too often because I don't like that kind of stop, rush, hurry up, get it done, you know, uh, attitude, even though I understand. So, so I, to answer your question again, um, yeah, um, ninety percent of my uh, clients are private collectors, and you guys, you know all of them, sure. Yeah. And all the the small production companies and all the sculptors, it's all the same guys, you know, that we all know. So I deal with them almost every day. So, so I I don't uh, I'm not too familiar with you know having a piece that's not painted. I, I don't do a whole lot of the custom game and stuff. I'm just. Uh -huh. I'm too scared, but um, so let's say when you when you get a customer and they want you to paint something, do you prefer that person to be kind of more like hands on, like it's got to be this way, this way, this way, or do you? I would imagine you would still you you lean more towards the, you know, they just hand you a piece, they say, I know you're going to do a great job, do your thing. I kind of want it in this direction, but you know, you do you. Well, you know, we have a my clients and I will have a brief. And we'll either do it, I think Jerry and I did it by, by uh, face to face, uh, or at least I'll do it. I always want to have a phone call, at least a phone call with the client to, to get a feel for him, uh, to get an idea of what he wants. And uh, you're right, you know, some clients are just say, you know, I love your work, knock it out of the park, do what you want, you know, I'm not going to let you, you tell you what to do. Uh, other people are, you know, more dangerous and they've got. I want you to do this, I want you to do that, I want this, I want that, I want this, that, color. I tend to stay away from those types of clients because, um, and this is again a personal thing, it kind of um, destroys your creativity a little bit, you know, um, you know, and it's not, I'm not trying to be oversensitive about it because um, I will only do, only, you know, not work with another client if they, they're so hardcore that they won't realize it's something that I might suggest is actually even better in the long run for the for the project than what they think they want. So I don't come across people like that anymore because I won't work. For them. I just won't work for them. So, but um, you know, it's I always say it's their done. It's their money. And right. This is not a hobby anymore. It used to be. But when you're dropping uh, almost as much money on shipping as you are on the, on the kit, right? And um, then you're paying a painter and you have to ship it to the painter and ship it back. 
you know, you're going to be into it for thousands of dollars, no matter what. Right. So I think it's very important to take their ideas and enhance them with my abilities as a leader, as an artist, to make it even better. So that's that's the way I look at it. And um, it seems to be the most successful way to do it. When I talk to other guys that are really successful painters, is that you really have to listen to what people want. And you have to, when you show them the pictures, they have to love it. And then when they open the box, they have to love it more. Now that's the, that's the gold standard. Hmm. Makes sense. You know, do you collect your, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, do you collect stuff yourself? I, th I thought I've, for some of the, the people listen, or watching us maybe may mm -hmm. not know that you, you collect some stuff too. Yeah, I started collecting Sideshow when they first came out. Uh, they were um, Baker Brothers before that, with a couple of guys I know. And then they uh, kind of closed down for a couple of months and came back as Sideshow. And they started doing uh, some quarter scale pieces, some small statues. They were kind of breaking the ground for what they are now. And uh, the creativity got better, the costumes got better, the paint jobs got better. And so I started collecting some of the first, uh, you know, uh, premium format pieces. The Hulk, Captain America, Thor, Doctor Doom on the throne, uh, some of the Star Wars pieces that they came out with. The, you know, as their production value, their, their pieces got better, their likenesses got better. If you recall some of the early pieces that we all bought, it didn't really look like Harrison Ford. It didn't really look like Terry Fisher or whoever, you know. And then they finally came upon some artists who could really nail a likeness. And that really makes the difference, I think, for anybody buying any piece. If it doesn't look sure. like the, the actor, I don't want it. So they got better at that. They got better at uh, the costumes, the fabric, fabrication. You know, the collars didn't look like something out of a you know, a 70s disco film. You know, everything proportionately started to look better. So, yeah, so I, I started with Sideshow and Bowen. And, um, you know, back, it was back when you could literally, you could call Randy Bowen and talk to Randy Bowen on the phone. You know, wow. just him and his wife and a couple other people. And, um, yeah, Casey Love. Um, I bought stuff from Casey when he was living with his parents back in the 90s. And, uh, you know, he's a great, great uh, sculptor and painter. He worked in film for years and works for Sideshow full time now as a painter. And I think he does some sculpting too. So, yeah, you know, it was the early days of all this. And it was great to, you know, to be on that ride early and see how much better it's gotten. It's just, if you were, if you were collecting now, just the, the, the sculpts, the quality of the castings, the painting, everything is so much better. You know, you guys got it good. Even though it's expensive. <laughs> you know, back in those days, it was like, you know, there's four pieces. You know, choose from those four. From three companies. And that's all you had. So, yeah, it's... Uh, I started then, and I collected... I, I was lucky collecting when it was still inexpensive. Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, Doctor Doom on the Throne cost me three hundred and twenty-five dollars. Oh wow! So, Are you getting a new one? Uh, no, I'm. I've gotten very, very particular about okay. what I buy, and space is a problem. My house is filled with statues in just about everywhere. Oh, nice. You know, I don't show them a lot. I've got a couple pics on my Facebook page in my collection, but. Um, no, it's, I think also you kind of live vicariously by painting the stuff, you know? I, I spend a week with it, intimate, intimately painting it, and I get to photograph them, I get to put it in my, my uh, you know, files, my photo photography files. So I don't really need to, you know, buy everything and have it sitting on a shelf. So not as much as I used to is my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any times where you've wanted to get a piece and then you get it in to paint it and you're like uh, i don't really want that piece anymore it's it's not as 
the way that I thought it would be, or maybe vice versa, that there was a piece that you passed on and then you got it into paint that you were like, oh, I kind of wish I, I had pulled the trigger on that. Uh, yeah, there's a couple. You know, it's, it's um, I did, like I said before, I did a lot of repainting the slideshow stuff, especially when they were still hand painting the eyes and stuff like that. Yeah, you know, now they're using right. decals. You know, they just use a, they just pop a decal in, which is pretty brilliant because who wants to paint, you know, 5,000 sets of eyes, right? Yeah, and have I mean, to do with like googly eyes or whatever. Yeah. yeah, I'll paint that many eyes. So, yeah, it was kind of, um, there were a couple pieces that I got and I was like, you know, that's a really nice piece. Or friends of mine got and they'd show me pictures of it and I'm like, you know, I should have got that. But again, it's when you, have a constant influx of stuff that you're painting for other people. Um, yeah. You know, like again, you don't really need to, you know, have put it on the shelf. And I have a, you know, a real theory about that, if you don't mind. <laughs> Go ahead. Collecting is about two things it's about having, but it's about getting. You are on the hunt. Yeah. yeah. You get, you start out, you see a piece, and oh, I gotta have, I gotta have that piece, right? So you pre-order it, right? And you wait and you wait and you see the pictures and you know you can't wait to get it. And finally, you know it's being shipped. You get the box, you open it up, you take it out, you put it on your dining room table probably the first day. And, uh, <laughs> honey, you got to look. At Harvard knows that. You know the kids, the kids. <laughs> that happens for about two or three days, maybe a week. Then it goes on the shelf, and all the other stuff. And then you'll walk into the room and you'll look at it for a few minutes, you know, or you, and then eventually it kind of merges into the background with all the other pieces that you bought. You know, at least to me it does. You know, and it's like anything else. You can't, I don't think you can give your attention to every piece you bought, you know, every day all the time. But I think it's more sometimes about the chase, about the next piece, you know, right. that you're going to. And uh, when I started to, that started to click on my head, I was like, I think I want to be more judicial about what I buy. I think I want to either buy it for resale purposes so I can get a nice two-year run out of enjoying it and then still get a good return on it. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Yeah, I mean, somebody else can enjoy it. Or I'm going to keep it for years. If it's so cool that it's iconic in some sense. You know, because every so often the statue will come out. You know, there's a million Magnetos, there's a million Hulks, there's a million Captain Americas, all the, you know, the top tier guys. But every so often, one will come out, and Jerry's got two of them right behind him, <laughs> that that are really iconic, you know, in what they did, the way they sculpted it, the way they painted it, the pose, everything about it screams, that's, that's Captain America, or that's the Hulk. So you look for those, right? I mean, that's the ones you look for, you know. And then when those pop up, uh, they're hard to pass pass up. I think that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah, Walton, I, I, I agree. Walton in the chat says you make it sound like a drug addiction. <laughs> it is. It is. It absolutely is. You know, it's like anything else when you. I mean, statue collecting. It's still really a new phenomenon, you know, when you think about it. It hasn't been around that long, right, just through the 2000s. And really, I mean, Marvel Marvel films really had a lot to do with it. Sure. You know, when they when, when Iron Man came out, I guess it was 08, was it 08? They uh, had their company and their lawyers go around and look for anybody. And I mean, anybody that had a non-licensed piece that they were selling, they sent them a, <coughs> a cease and desist, which means you can no longer manufacture or sell that piece, because they knew that they were going on this ride with, you know, Iron Man, and they, they had a 10-year plan there. So when that, I think when that took off, that the statue business really took off, too. You know, that was the, the start of the, the real mania. Did you? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Barb. Oh, I was gonna say I think that like for our generation, like I think we were from the generation that still played with toys 
Yeah. So where you would buy the, you know, the Marvel Legends, like the little Marvel toys or whatnot. Right. And for us, you know, growing up, like me and my husband, we we got married at a very young age. We've known each other since we were 15 and we got married at 18. So we both, uh, you know, pretty much grew up together and we had both this love of, well, he collected comics. I grew up watching like the X-Men cartoons or uh, Ninja Turtles and Bat, you know, the Batman cartoons and right. stuff like that. So like for us, you know, we had our first son like in the, in in 2000 and right around that time was when we collected our first Boeing, which was like 2002. Right. And for us, it was kind of like an upgrade to those toys, you know, <laughs> so yeah, that's just and we've been collecting ever since. We've sold a few things here or there, you know, but for the most part, I, I still even have stuff from back then, but uh, yeah. it is an addiction because newer stuff comes out and you know, they're a lot more detailed. They're a lot more sophisticated than they were back in 2000. So it, yeah, it's like, yeah. do you ever see an end to this? <laughs> it's like it never stops. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. As long as there's money in it. I mean, you know, Marvel kind of blew their wad, if you'll excuse this phrase, uh, when, you know, after Endgame. You know, because that was their that was their key players right there. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they're, I think they're kind of scrambling a little bit to see what the next really big thing is going to be. Because they fuel this, you know, it's, the movie comes out, there's a collectible, there's a statue for the character, you know. And maybe we can squeeze in a couple of the, 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 uh, the you know, the B, the B team too. Yeah, by making more of the A team. Yeah. yeah, you know, so that's what they do. That's It's a, it's a franchise business. They... They go to these these uh, conventions and they they lay out their year plan. You know what is Sideshow going to uh, you know produce based on these franchises and how successful are these franchises going to be? You know, and um, I mean Hot Toys does it. You know, they they do it very well. You know, as soon as there's a movie out, they've already bang, they've already got the the figure. You know, you know, it looks just like the guy. <laughs> but um, yeah, if you get the farther back you go, the crappier, like you were saying, the crappier the toys got. You know, when I was a kid, I mean, we had Captain Action. <laughs> as a kid, Did you say Captain. You know, Connection? I bet you don't even know who that is. Do you? No, I don't. You said Captain yeah. Connection, right? No, yeah. Captain Action. Captain Action. He was a ideal, uh, ideal. Yeah, was, was that a, before GI Joe? Uh, Nice. Yeah, it's it was around 66, the same time as GI Joe. Sixty-six, GI Joe. Yeah, sixty-six. Or so. Okay. But you could take him and uh, put a Captain America costume on him or a Batman costume on him. All right. And that's and they were terrible, but that's all you had. So you really had to use your imagination to have any kind of fun with those things. But watching that progress over the years is kind of amazing. I mean, it's right now. It's just you guys are in paradise. You know? Yeah, the golden age of uh, statues. You know, it's a shame it's gotten so expensive, but a lot of it's had to do with COVID. It really has. You know, it really, it really put a, a snafu on, on shipping. And I thought back in 2002, the statues were expensive when they would come up with a piece that was 300 or 400 bucks. Yeah. That's what I was saying before. Uh, Doctor Doom was 325. Yeah. Yeah. Five years ago, I sold them for twenty two hundred. Wow! So, That's insane. Yeah, you know it's just it's just crazy, and you know he he kept obviously the those Grail premium format kits from uh, Sideshow kept their value exercised. But uh, yeah, yeah, even Bowens are holding up. Um, yeah, it's. Well, uh, I think they're great. I think they have a really like a charm to them. You know. He really captured a comic book drawing kind of look to the way he sculpted. Yeah. Sure. So I grabbed a bunch. Of, I grabbed a bunch of pictures. Um, should we maybe go through some of those pictures and talk about uh, talk about those? So I'm going to share. Let's see here. I think I'm going to share. Uh, Oops, sorry, I do Zoom all the time, and uh, okay. 
Don't get nervous, Jerry. Get Just it. hit the share button in the bottom middle. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm on it. I'm on it. All right. Uh, okay. All right. Here we go. So that's. Oops. And I'm going to get another beer while you do this. Just <laughs> Shut up, you. All right. Here we go. I was letting you know I'm going to grab a beer. I wasn't being a jerk. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I was being a jerk. <laughs> okay, so I, th I think this is one of your newest pieces. Yeah, yeah. And um, and I was I was admiring it before the show, and I I don't know the I, I guess we don't talk about custom statues and where they come from, sort of the mm -hmm. honor amongst custom people. But uh, I thought this was brilliant with um, Snow White on one side and the Evil Queen on the other side, and so. Uh, Let's take a look here. There's the, I mean, the detail on this bird was absolutely fantastic. Um, you, do you paint this stuff under magnifying glass? Uh, I have, uh, you know, visors that magnify. You know, and then there's yeah. the, there's yeah, the well, opposite I, side. Yeah. The is this first, a statue or like one of like the miniatures? No, this, this is a statue. Garage, garage kit. Oh, it's, it's, one, okay. it's one six scale. Oh, one six scale. Okay. So is that the is the mirror transparent? Is that how you see Snow White? Well, the mirror there? was um, I I made that. There was no mirror with the kit. Oh wow! Um, it was a piece of plexiglass. So I got some sheet plexiglass. So I cut it to shape, and then what I did is I got some window tint. You know, for you know, commercial window tint, and I cut right. that to shape, and then I added it to the uh, the glass to the the plexiglass. And it worked really well because you could see the reflection and you could see through it at the same time. Yeah, That's pretty this cool. is... so you got both. You got both. You know, uh, characters in each slide. That's which, fantastic. Uh, I was thank God that worked because it took me a long time to put the film <laughs> together. And, and, this, and this, go ahead. And, and with this kit, um, did this kit kind of throw you off track? I, I no, this is what I used to do all the time. Um, I used to do stuff like this before I painted statues. They were very intricate. They were uh, fairly well cast, but everything had to be glued together. Everything had to be pinned. Everything had to be magnet. You had to put your own magnets in. And everything, after you finish it, it all has to be made to take apart and ship to somebody. There's no custom box. Or <coughs> oh, wow. So this is, you know, I've got it easy now. Yeah. Back then, when I was doing this all the time, it was very difficult to uh, figure out how the hell I'm going to show this to the client and then break it apart and have him put it back together again. So this has, like the Queen, I won't go real far into this, but the Queen has about 16 pieces on her. Wow. And all those pieces had to be glued and put. I had to put tiny pins in these pieces of fabric on her arms. I added the uh, foam on the glass. Um, you know, all these pieces, her arms, I put magnets in her arms, and uh, all the little fins on her shoulders and her hips, the um, crown, the uh, collar of her uh, cape and everything, all that had to be glued on. You know, and everything had to be pre-assembled, so it worked, and then painted, and then assembled. And then you make a custom box to ship it? I haven't done that yet. I'm going to work on it this weekend. But like in this shot here, the um, zodiac signs, um, the kit came with two skulls, and I put the skulls into the zodiac there. I thought that would be cool. I made the top of the table from scratch. I made the uh, labels for the books. I made the scroll on the floor. Um, this is a client I've had for about 12 years. And uh, there's a whole series of these that were made by a small kit company. And they're based on J. Scott Campbell, the illustrator. Uh -huh. I was going to say, that's what it looks like to me. Yeah, and he's a, uh, you know, he does these sexy takes on the Grim Fairy thing. <laughs> yeah, it definitely looks like the 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 Tinkerbell I have, like the face uh, of yeah. the Tinkerbell I have from, uh, from J. Scott. Yeah, that's the same guy, the same the same series. <laughs> and uh, But these were done yeah. as kits. We've done us. And I've done about uh, eight or nine of these for the same client. Although, you know, that's pretty it, cool. Uh, I like this kit. Do you, Do you have a uh, a favorite line that you like to do? Rather it be you know like a a Disney 
type run or a Marvel run or a DC run? Do you have one that you get more excited for than the other? Or is it just, you know, each time you get a new piece, it's, you know, just another yeah. chance to challenge yeah, yourself and enjoy it. I shouldn't say it, but, you know, I actually like monsters. Okay. I like monsters. Uh, that's when I started out painting monsters, and, you know, Frankenstein and, you know, Dracula and the mummy and all that. And then when the superhero thing came along, that's what was available. That's what everybody wanted. And I loved Marvel Comics. I grew up reading Marvel Comics in the early 60s when all these guys first came out. So, and, you know, that's when I started uh, doing artwork from, I started drawing all, drawing like my own comic books when I was a kid. Oh, nice. So I have a love for these guys as much as I have a love for monsters. Um, but to answer that specifically, like if you stop right there for a minute, Jerry, this is a an, a, an example where, where a collector actually let me go kind of crazy, where I created the shadow on the top of the base. That's oh my God! I didn't even I I thought that was the oh, light. I thought that was light. Oh my God! Thing. That little ninja <laughs> that looks amazing. Yeah, that's a that's a painted shadow. So, wow! Oh my you know, God! He wanted, wanted it to look like the first uh, issue of that Spider-Man appeared in, and there's a real particular look to that. So I said, well, yeah, you know, we can paint the the kit like that. You know, we can do kind of unusual shadows on it. But let's do the base the same way. You know, so stuff like that really excites me because I can think outside the box. You know, so yeah, that. Uh, if, you, if you wouldn't have mentioned that, I would have never known. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm well aware of that. You know, he's in a he's in a case, and the shadows are behind him. Yeah, yeah. We're, now, we're now that you really now that you say it, it makes yeah. all the sense. Yeah, but. now I feel dumb for not noticing it before. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jubilee. Yeah. I, oh, I know the custom company. That oh, I've seen this one. Oh, I remember where you made like the galaxy and the, uh, or no, I guess it's more well, that's fireworks, her, yeah, right? that's, that's the sparks coming out of her hands. That's her Yeah, secret. yeah, yeah. Her powers. Right. And I, you know, the client wanted something different. And I said, well, why don't we do the sparks, you know, coming out of her hands? We'll put it on the base, you know, and it'll kind of tie in the base to her. Right. And that's the, Which little hand brush and airbrush. Was this for Todd? Yes. <laughs> oh, really? That lucky yeah. sob. Nice. This is actually uh, Ryan's favorite character. No, it's not, but it looks great. <laughs> you made her, I don't like Jubilee, no, but you made her that, very cool. Uh, it wasn't for Todd, it was for Kurt. You know Kurt Perkins? No. You know, he's another. He's a real, real high-end collector, too. Oh, uh, really? Maybe he's not yeah, that active yeah. in the community. I haven't. I don't know him. Very cool. Yeah, he, he pops in every so often, but he... Uh, he might be one of those lurker types. You know, there's a lot of people who just kind of sit there. <laughs> Wait, I'm not making it mean. I'm just saying there's a lot of people who don't like to converse. They just I, like to kind I don't, of read. I don't talk ever myself. I mean, I just look at yeah. stuff. It's, you know, there's That's so fair. much to look at. You can't, you can't comment on everything. <laughs> Sorry, Ryan, I'm going to use bad. that as a uh, compliment next time. I'll get, so I'm like, you know what? You look like one of those lurker types. <laughs> well, I've, been drinking, I've been drinking uh, Diet Coke and vodka. So Sorry. <laughs> my, my tact is out the window. I, I, I didn't mean that in a negative way. I just meant like, yeah. <laughs> sure. Oh, this piece is nice, Dave. This is, this is that jerk Jerry's piece. Isn't it? <laughs> hey, my God. What a pain. No. <laughs> no, it looks it looks great. Oh, thanks. It was yeah. Uh, this guy must have been a giant pain in the ass, right? Really. I bet he was. I referred him to you. <laughs> no, your fault. I'll take the blame. That's cool. Now this one was fun. It was really well. It was a real classic comic look, you know, to the sculpt. Which at first, when I looked at it, I thought, you know, he looked kind of goofy. But once it got paint on it. You know, Are you talking about the client or the uh, statue? <laughs> Just kidding. Sorry. But no, that was uh, that was a fun one to do. So, John, do you will you paint the same statue statue multiple times? So obviously, different clients type thing. Or do you have like a, a one and done? Or if you do one one way, will you try to do the other one completely different? Or it depends on the client. It depends on the piece. I've done. Repainted Poison Ivy from Sideshow probably about seven times. All the oh, one with their hands above her head? Yeah. The J that's J. Scott Campbell too, or is that Archer? No, that's Art that's yeah. Archer. 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 Yeah. Oh. But um, you know, so 
It just depends on that the piece. piece looks nice. I and, can't believe uh, I, I had this piece, John. I sold it like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> that one was right. fun too because uh, that's got a really nice sculpt to it, and we did a lot of fun, a lot of fun uh, work on the blues. Well, that mm -hmm. th that custom company has very good prints kits. Oh yeah, well, I you mean know that the, was the Jubilee too, right? It was the same yeah, one. You know that they they use the same company as Sancho. The Sancho si yeah, uses ownage too. Yeah, I, I mean everybody that. everybody in the day used ownage. They were the big place to go because they were doing the best castings. There's more companies that have come up now, and a lot of people are obviously 3D printing, but Ownage would, you know, work for just about anybody. So, you know, and they're very, very good at what they do. I love what you do with the claws there. Thanks. Yeah. Now, the next one is going to show. Oh, that's another. Oh, that's a garage garage Hellraiser kit. or uh, Hellboy. That's another garage kit. This guy, uh, uh, Mark Warling, he has a, a small company called Pestilence Labs. And he did the whole line of busts uh, with, um, based on uh, the uh, Hellboy, first so, Hellboy. I, I'm curious because I don't know much about the garage kits. A, a mm -hmm. garage kit and a custom statue, the same thing, right? Just a smaller Absolutely, run? Absolutely, yeah. Same thing, okay. same process. Well, you know, but it's still uh, done in China, or is it actually done locally with like, no, a No, most of them are cast and produced here in the United States. Okay, cool. Yeah. Very cool. 90% of them. I was um, curious because uh, when you were talking about All the guys that work for Sideshow and all these people that I know, they all started out doing this. You know, oh, doing that. That's where they came from. This is Todd's, too, if I remember correctly. That's Todd's, yeah. Because he was like, I'm having so-and-so doing uh, an Emma. That was a very And he didn't tell me who, and then I saw the pictures, and I was like, these yeah, are yours, a, aren't you, jerk? <laughs> a lot of details, a lot of, you had to be very careful. Women, women kits are very deep, uh, deep, uh, difficult. Well, so I bet these yeah. are especially, right, when she's wearing nothing. <laughs> Well, you know, there's a lot of flesh tones that you have to, you know, women uh, take a lot of airbrush to uh, make them really look, you have to make them look beautiful. And These so, are great skin tones, by the way. Thanks. So, so John, have you uh, have you broken any pieces while painting them? I did. Uh, I, I broke, I've broken one piece in 20 years. Oh, oh wow. wow. That's a good, wow. that's, that's a, a good record. That's a badass track record, man. It was a cape, you know, I was holding, I was holding this cape over my table here and it fell hit wrong and I broke in three pieces and I you know I fixed it but this is one of those weird things I just finished showing the client <laughs> oh. I, I, I don't think I don't think you touched on this before how did you learn how to fix a lot of them well again I would think that's a totally kit, different skill old kits you had to do everything you, they come with seam lines they come with pothole you know uh, pinholes they come with all kinds of deformities you have to sand, you have to sculpt, you have to get the thing in the condition. Wait, Barb, so this, is the one, Barb this is the one you have. Yeah, I've actually had every one of those that you've shown. <laughs> well, I had, I I had that, we I call had that, that a humble Emma. Bird, John. I have that Emma. She's from the Phoenix 5 uh, set. And then I have the Nightcrawler, yep. and I have this one. This is the Phase 3. That's a great, this is a great piece, too. I really like this yeah, one. He, he's right here on my uh, table right there. Yeah, this is Franco, right? Yeah. Uh, no, Alejandro. 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 Yeah. Alejandro. Scare or whatever. Yeah. Great sculpture. Yeah, he's dope. Yeah, that was a fun build. That. that uh, this I think's Franco, right? I got that. No, no, no this, is, this is Alejandro also. Oh, is it? No, I have that I'll one too. Yeah. Corner. Jeez, I'm wrong. Right. Yeah, that was a that was fun to paint. That was a nice. Uh, he had a nice. Uh, face that one's sculpt. a good statue, but it has uh, the the mask portrait is very nice, but the mm -hmm. this portrait is wacky. And it I, like it. It. I like it. He's got a lot of expression. I like yeah, the cigar on this one. Yes. I but understand the, where you're coming from, Barb. But the original paint on it makes it even wackier. Whoa. <laughs> Is that Captain Cap Sam? That's yeah. that's the Daniel Bell sideshow, but it's got yeah. a custom it's head. A head scope, right? Yeah. yeah, this guy had a custom head that he uh, had the Falcon, you know. So is this suit from the comics, or is this kind of like his inspiration? No, it's a stealth. It was his idea for a stealth. He it looks good. It looks, looks great. Cool. Yeah. Example of a client, you know, kind of dictating really closely what he wanted. I love how many different blues you have. Thanks. <laughs> you know, he, he wanted a real stealth, real dark look, and uh, he had this custom head to go along with it. We did the other head too, but uh, 
but it, it, was, it looks so much more interesting with all these different blues. I mean, you've got to have at I least agree. one, two. No, you know, there's got to be five or six blues in there. It's also the difference between uh, getting a comic book accurate statue paint and uh, like a, a Marvel movie. You know, Marvel movies would take these characters and they kind of take them down a little bit. You know, they yeah, were like three or four colors. weren't so, you know, bright and, and ridiculous looking. And this is more, you know, I think along that, that road. Yeah, I'm really when, interested to see what they do. Sorry, I'm really interested what they do. See what they do with the X Men costumes. That'd be awesome to you because I'm a big X Men fan. What were you going to say? I yeah, think it's Jerry. Sure we were very muted. Yeah, 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 and that makes sense. When you do a repaint like this, is it more difficult? Uh, not as difficult because the thing is uh, already assembled, or more difficult because you have to. It's a good question. You have to mask and. It's, it's. It's kind of a wash because, like you said, this is uh, pretty much assembled, so you can't take an individual piece and just paint it, right? So you have to mask something off. You have to really think out your approach to painting, what you're going to do first. You know, we kind of work, painters kind of work from the inside out, you know, the, whatever's the hardest to get at, and you want to get that done and work your way out. But, yeah, that's, that's the drawback to this. Uh, but that's also the plus. It's paint. I mean, it's a symbol. So you don't have to do anything. You just have to paint. So it eliminates that, but it also complicates it at the same time. Hey, Sean, we had a question in the chat. Or John, I'm sorry. I was looking at my friend, Sean, who asked one of the questions. Um, and uh, uh, one of our, you know what? I can bring it up. Shit. Um, no, wait, that's not it. That's one of them. Um, <laughs> he was saying, do you like the process of the results better? Is there is there something that you enjoy more than the other? Another good question. Um, one is tied to the other for, for what I do. Um, the, a lot of the times the clients uh, don't see how much, how many layers of paint you're putting on something to, to bring it to life, to really make it pop. And you have to put in the work in, at the beginning of the paint process to get the result at the end. So I guess that kind of answers it. You know, it's the process is part of getting the result that you're happy with at the end. Um, a lot of times uh, people don't realize how many layers of paint there are being applied to really make something look like it has depth, like it's actually a piece of, piece of clothing, or, you know, a person has, you know, uh, freckles and different, you know, things in their face that give you that flesh color. It's not just taking a bottle of flesh paint and slapping it on a figure. And there's a lot. There's a lot more to the process to make a character come alive. Because the way I look at it, I'm a long, you know, I'm I'm part of a long line of people. It starts with a concept, then to a sculptor, then to a caster, maybe a fabricator, and then finally to a painter. You know, so I'm at the end of the line, and it's my responsibility to make them look like they're alive, you know, that they have a little life to them. So. And the same gentleman had another question. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to put it up here, uh, Jerry. Feel free to steer away if this no, is doing too many. But uh, he says, does John like a more dynamic statue or something more museum, or do, do you care? Or is it more about question. the character? Yeah, that's another good one. Um, one of the things that uh, is indicative of collecting is that there's only so many poses. <laughs> yeah, there's only so many. Only and, so and a many. lot of the companies are reusing poses, if you've seen Well, recently. they have to because there's, yeah. there's the iconic museum pose. There's the yeah. po pose you pull from the comic book or the pose you pull from the movie. So you've only got a couple. Nobody's going to want their, their character in a pose that's not complementing their character. Is that so the kind of portrait? Right, what? Is that the portrait from the X Force Wolverine? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's one of the heads. So this this is Franco, uh, if I remember correctly. It is, yeah. yes. So you know, to me, that's you know, you're kind of stuck in a loop. What do you do? You, you know, you, you try a different pose. Nobody likes it. You try a classic pose. What are they going to say? There, you know, people are going to pick at stuff no matter what. I think, when it comes Just, to that, but I mean, I've got. Oh, sorry. 
No, no, finish your thought. I'm so sorry. I was going to say, I've got, you know, um, Iron Studios, Chris Evans, Captain America here, and I, in the classic pose holding. The one-fourth, right? The journal, yeah, with, you know, with the shield, and I love it. So, you know, it just depends. Is that the one from Endgame or uh, yeah, Civil War? Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, you know, and it's, it's beautiful. Do you, I'm curious, do you, do you talk to any sculptors? Like, are there sculptors that you're friendly with? Besides, like, Casey Love? Oh, uh, yeah, you know, we, we, everybody's busy. We don't really have time to yeah. chit-chat, but. I was, I'm always curious how that world works. Him, but, you know, I know Casey really well. I've taught it. I was, uh, assisted him in a, a painting class uh, quite a few years back, and I see him at a lot of shows. Very, really nice guy. Um, you know, I've brushed shoulders with a lot of, a lot of people over the years and talk to them. I see them at shows a lot, but, you know, everybody's pretty busy and it's like, you know, it's more like, hey, that looks great, you know, great job. More than, more than you know, really chatting. Yeah. Right, John. I really liked your take on this Doom. Um, was that, uh, was this the client's direction or, or, this or your direction? This is literally all the client, except for the throne. This is God Doom, right? Yeah, yeah. He wanted to do a God Doom, and uh, he wanted that really bright blue on the fabric, which I resisted. <laughs> it was work. Yeah, you know, I thought it was going to turn out like looking like like something out of Las Vegas. But, <laughs> you know, it worked. It really worked. And, uh, I I really liked that the that you went shiny on the armor. The factory paint on this statue was like a dull, and it uh, actually looks like metal. Yeah, there's yeah. a real there's a real drawback to that, you know, when you get too dirty in the armor, it starts to look like plastic. So you literally have to paint it to look like chrome and then dull it down. So some of the shine shows through like real metal. See, so is this like a do you call this like a semi gloss? Like what type of uh on the on the metal? Yeah, like it's a silver, but like what? It's actually a chrome paint. It's oh, really? a lacquer chrome paint, yeah. Oh wow! He just yeah. said that, Ryan. God, did he? My bad. <laughs> like this, I, I'm I'm a, I'm a computer guy, mm -hmm. IT guy. So like anything creative is mind blowing to me because like I'm that's foreign to me. So that's why I'm asking these questions. So Paul, yeah, there you go, Jerry. That's the picture that that's the blue I wanted to use. Yeah. So I I, I was going to ask you about that. What happened? This one looks. I like the way this looks. It looks more like leather and it's more muted. But uh, that's, well, that's you know I I. I aim toward realistic painting. I like things to look real. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, our creed as painters is that it should look like something real got shrunk down to one quarter scale. Yeah, it should look real, no matter what it is. This is Franco's too, right? Yeah, this is. Franco. Yeah, that's the same piece. That that's very interesting. That like you were saying, how you want it to look something real shrunk down, because like. Yeah, you know, there we've had several conversations where it's do you prefer your pieces to look more straight out of the comics or do you want them to look more realistic? Mm -hmm. So that that's very interesting that yeah, you're 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 wanting it to look real shrunk down. So that, that's pretty cool. Well, you know, you, when you look at it as a person, you know, uh, the thing that always destroys things is when something shine is too shiny. Right? right. You know, it looks like a plastic toy or something's not shiny enough, it doesn't look like metal. So we strive to make, you know, fabric shouldn't reflect, uh, metal should reflect. You know, like this, you can see that everything's pretty dull because it should be. Right. It should be reflecting, you know, there shouldn't be like a shine on his costume, you know, depending on, the, of course, the superhero and what, you know, his costume, but that's the, that's really the key. So, so John, with every with with your collection that you've got, since you've got pieces everywhere, when you get a piece in, do you do you touch up pieces here and there as you see fit? Do you say, "Hey, I'm not going to touch that. That's that's fine." Good question. I've I've done that for myself, and I've done that for clients. I've got a couple pieces that clients have sent me from sideshow that I told them, "Look, I can't improve on this. I'm not going to take your money just to." you know, give you a really bad return on it. You know, I could make it look a little better, but not to the point to where you're going to go, wow, it just looks so much better. Right. So I don't do that. You know, I don't do the same thing with mine either. Uh, I've touched up a few pieces before in the past, but um, 
on the whole, I'm pretty, you know, I'm, I'm usually pretty happy, especially now with the pre-painted factory look on most yeah. things. You know, plus I don't have the time. You know, right, yeah, I meant that. Oh, that's uh, what is, is this? Is this a sideshow? Yes, this is uh, yeah, sideshow oh. Thanos on throne. Dude, that is wicked. <laughs> this is another huge project I did. Uh, but that was fun, you know, because he, he, another, this guy let me go. He just let me do what I want. You're like Voldemort from Harry Potter with all these like bases, man. It's crazy. <laughs> it was great. I don't understand the yeah. reference, but good job, Ryan. <laughs> Which is weird because you're like eight. Okay, that was a piece he loved. Uh, he, he did the, uh, you know, uh, we call it, uh, the main piece on that. Uh -huh. And uh, he did a great job. But uh, we just took it in a different direction. Now, this is that same series by that guy that you were asking about before, Jerry. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, it's another uh, Jay Scott Campbell. Campbell. Oh, wow. Yeah. I haven't seen Another this garage one. kit. These are all separate pieces that had to be, you know, glued together and painted. But, uh, nice. How do, you, how do you gauge time on putting these things together? Like, I, well, I don't think you that's know, when you've done, like anything, when you've done it a long time, yeah, I can usually crazy. look at the job and know how long it's going to take. You know, that's going to be a week. That's going to be two weeks. You know, it's. Uh, and when you paint every, almost every day, you know, as your job, you can get a lot done. You know, in a seven-hour day. And I think about that. If you were painting for a hobby and you're only putting an hour a night on the weekends, yeah. it takes you forever. So yeah, you you can you can do a lot of damage in the hour day. Wow. So, so John, since you're you're doing so much painting and stuff, I mean, I, I could only imagine like if I'm, you know, painting a flat wall, my my hand will start to cramp up and type stuff, or you know. I would imagine your your eye, you know, straining, or even that, you know, you're using magnifying stuff. Mm -hmm. You have stuff that you do that you're like, you know, you, you may get frustrated on, and you're like, that's enough, enough. I got to go blow off some steam. Do you have like a go to type thing, rather it be, you know, racket yeah, ball or ball? Well, I, well, I, you know, I, I structure it like a business. Like, you know, I go to work. I go to work at 9 30, I take a break at 11, I eat lunch at 1. And I work till, you know, four o'clock. Then I take a break around 2.30. You know, I take my breaks, I get away from it. Uh, the whole thing with this is that your eye muscles are focused on such a narrow field of vision that they start to get really, really sore. So right. you, have yeah, fatigue, right? that, you have to change the, the, the vision distance. You have to look at something farther away. So your eyes relax for a while, you know. And you, this gets more paramount as you get older, I'll tell you. I used to be able to paint for hours and hours when I was younger. I, I can't do that. I can do about I can do about twenty minutes to a half hour on detail work, and then I got to stop for a few minutes, you know, and then go back. But I'm talking about really tiny detail work. Right. So yeah, it's you just learn how to pace yourself, you know, as, as time goes on. Do Do you ever like you're you're doing it day and you see it, you you know you, you view it as a job. And you're doing killer work. Are there ever times when you think, or, or that maybe you take long breaks or anything like, no more new clients. I've just got to, you know, get away from it so that when I go back to it, I can be excited again and, and put a lot of passion into it. Or don't give him any ideas. I've got lots of plans for him. <laughs> anything I can do to mess with Jerry. I mean, it's full of stuff. This is payback. Just, you need a yeah. Break, John. Take a long break, especially with Jerry's pieces. I'll take a vacation when it's Jerry's turn. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really about um, structuring again, like a, like a job. You know, we take vacations. Uh, I live in Phoenix, Arizona. There's a lot of really nice resorts here, beautiful places. And in the summer, their rates drop to about half price. Yeah. So we do a lot of stay vacations in the summer. We stay at these really nice resorts for two or three nights, you know, and I get away from it. And then we take, you know, pre-COVID, we take a nice vacation every year somewhere. So, so yeah, it's just like anything else. You uh, uh, To appreciate it, you have to get away from it. You know. You so know, what do you do at these resorts? Like just spa days or something? Because, like, it's hot as shit where you live. In the summer, it's even hotter, yeah, right? I've lived here for almost 35 years. I'm used to the heat. You know, it doesn't. 
But, uh, you know, we do nothing. We eat and we drink and we just relax. I mean, that sounds amazing, too. Don't get me wrong. I was just curious. I was like, I was just yeah. kind of like, what do you do? Like, it's hot. You, you know, you have to reach hotter, yeah. with anybody else. Uh, going to the shows, going to the conventions and seeing friends. You know, I've got all my good friends live on the other side of the country, which sucks. On the East Coast? I can only see them once or twice a year. You hear that, Jerry? On the East Coast. You know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, no, you know, actually, you know who Steve Rialhas is, Jerry? Who? Steve Rialhas. He's a painter. He paints for Sideshow. He lives in uh, Boulder, Colorado. Oh, does he? Oh. Yeah. Oh. But uh, anyways, you know. You can send you know, me his, email, his uh, contact info. <laughs> Don't do that, John. It'll he actually retired this. last week. <laughs> oh, really? Wow. No, not really. But, um, no, it's like anything else. You go to these conventions and you meet your buddies and you spend some time with them and you get recharged. You know, it's like going to Comic-Con, right, or whatever. That's awesome. You know, you get recharged and you get excited and you want to go back and you want to do it. This, for me, has been something that I've done all my life. Um, I had a just a love of figures. I used to collect army men, you know, as a little kid. And I'd take the army men and I'd paint them with testers, you know, the testers and enamel paints. And I'd take my dad's lighter and melt their arms and change their positions and do all kinds of crazy things when I was seven years old. Yeah. You know, so it just carried, it was something, I don't know how it started, but it just carried through all the way. Yeah. When you guys are together, is it more talking, or do you guys actually, and I'm not saying no, this like... You no, know, the first time I went to a convention, it was like, all I wanted to do was pick everybody's brain. You know, how did you do this? How did you do that? I was wondering if you don't bring your portfolios, you guys just share because no, it creates no, conversation. We, we basically, now it's just, we have a few drinks, we lost some steam, we kind of talk. Uh, you know, I like that piece that you did last week. or Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking. But... You know, it's, and we might be teaching a class, a painting class at that show. So there's work involved too, but we just, it's just camaraderie like anything, like this is, like you're, okay. you know, you're collectors, we're collectors. We have this common thing that we love. So it's the same thing, you know, and it's nice to physically see them. Since COVID, I've, I've got two other Zooms that I do every week with painters. You know, uh, and just to keep in touch. Yes, we have guest painters and sculptors come in every so often, just like this. But like on, like on YouTube or something, or just for your clothes? Um, no, on Zoom. Yeah, you know, private. one guy so goes, just a private. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's cool. a private thing, but we invite people in every so often, and it's it's great to get another uh, perspective, you know, from other people about how they see it, and you know, I mean, there's a lot of things about collecting, and a lot of things about you know, statues, you know, that we all have in common. Jerry's going to get a restraining order. And it's going to say, Jerry kept asking to be part of this Zoom call. <laughs> I kept telling him no. Back off, Jerry. <laughs> Still all of uh, Jerry's questions that I'm sure he wants to ask. But so your favorite as far as painting, you go back to the monster universe type thing. Yeah, as monster. far as what, what is your go-to movie, monster movie that you, you just – you could watch it over and over again. Well, see, I'm old school, and I also i I went to college for film directing and editing and film production. I worked in film for a couple of years, and you know, I got a I got a good taste for that. And I love film, so film was one of those things that films, sci-fi, you know, horror films, all that stuff. Um, my go-to films are the old, old classics from the '30s. You know, Frank. Oh, wow. Frankenstein, stuff like that. Uh, a lot of really old. I like classic uh, monsters. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Superheroes, obviously, I'm a big Marvel freak. I'm not as into DC as Marvel. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think growing up in the Silver Age and seeing all those guys come to life right in front of me as a 10 year old kid uh, made a, a big impression. You know, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko and uh, Jim Starenko, you know these guys were my these these guys were my heroes. Um, John, was, if I if I can if I can cut in real quick, sure. so what are some of your favorite heroes and villains? Well, my favorite superheroes, Captain America. Oh, nice. um, not not for any other reason. You know, I always liked the fact that he was somewhat, you know, he wasn't really a super hero. 
for a god like so grounded, right? He was somebody that was the peak of human evolution, physical evolution. And I thought that was kind of a cool thing to be with. So, you know, actually just a guy. Right. And uh, it wasn't the America thing or anything like that because his actual beliefs are kind of universal. You know, it's truth, sure. honesty, justice, almost like Superman. You know, yeah, same. Superman, Colossus, you name him, right? Uh, yeah, anybody, you know, anybody that, you know, stands up for what's really right. Mm-hmm. And so I like those things about his characters. And, and of course, I love Batman. You know, that's the one DC character. I love, you know, because he's so brooding and he's so broken and so dark. You know, he's got some of the craziest villains, you know, that are yeah. literally insane. And he's just hes just a really cool looking super. You mm-hmm. know, you hardly ever see a bad looking bat. You know, he just looks badass on every <laughs> every building and every statue, every, you know, base that they put him on. He looks great. So, you know, guys like guys like that, you know, they're pretty diametrically opposed, those two characters. But, uh, he's Batman's probably the closest thing to a monster type. Yeah, dark. yeah, I get that because that was what he was going for, right? Yeah, yeah. The bat, you know, like that was the thing, right? Yeah, and it started it out. I mean, what he was scared of. Started out a lot darker in the very beginning, and then it got kind of silly in the '60s because of the, uh, you know, the comic book code. You know, I don't, you know, I don't know if you guys know the comic book code. You know. The pulp right. magazines of the early in the late fifties were very risque. They were anything goes. You know, they had high sexual content. They had a lot of gruesome deaths, deaths in these pulp fiction stories that were pre-comic book. Uh-huh. And now, when kids started reading the comic books in the early sixties, they said, "You know, we got to have some kind of code for this. We can't, we can't, you can't just do whatever the hell you want." So <laughs> it's very strict about following that comics code up until probably 1965. But Marvel was always pushing it. Yeah. They are always pushing it as far as they could, you know, coming up with great stories. You know, you'd see a cover where Batman was saving Boy Scouts and the Fantastic Four were fighting, were fighting Galactus. Right. You know, mm-hmm. so there's quite a dichotomy there between storytelling and yeah. artwork. So, you know, DC caught up. They caught up really quickly. Especially in the late 60s with the hippie thing, and, you know, drugs and all that, when things started to kind of, you know, break open a little bit in society. Then things got more interesting all the way around and looser. Yeah, so, I, I started. Go ahead, Ryan. I was going to say, are those your, those your, are those your go to heroes? Those two guys? America, yeah, pretty much. I mean, I've got, I've got Captain America here. I've got picture of Chris Evans from Winter Soldier. I've got two Domenico signed comic book uh, covers here. Oh, and that's I, got awesome. a, I got a Nick Fury that I had custom built and sculpted based on Jim Serenko and Jack Kirby's artwork. Okay. Then I got three Batmans right over here. You know, the side show, one of the sideshow Batman. You know, so yeah. You know, those are those are kind of my guys. What what about uh villains like and, and then we'll go to art. Sorry, Mike. Did you say villains? Yeah, villains. Well, the Joker's pretty interesting character. He really is. Yeah, because you know, he's always he's, so unpredictable. And he's been in so many, you know, I think you got to thank Frank Miller for what he did for bringing yeah. him back. You know, he never would have gotten the exposure of the movies or any of that without those graphic novels. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, um, yeah, the villains I'm not as keyed on. Uh, Doctor Doom was a great villain. Galactus was a great villain. Um, you know, I thought Silver Surfer was a great kind of anti-hero. I like Black Bolt and Inhumans a lot. I thought that was a great story. I love Black Bolt. Um, I need to read more about him. Everything I hear, you know, I read on that movies. classic <laughs> era, you know, that yeah. you know, really bad. So. Oh. It's so funny because, like, going back and reading these comics, I'm reading Fantastic Four right now, and you know, it was made, I guess, what in the '60s. Fantastic Four came out. Yeah. So, so now we're we're so keen on our technology and everything, but in the comics, it's, it always kind of makes me laugh um, because you know, when a member of the Fantastic Four gets in trouble, you know, they don't send a text or anything like that. 
they pull out a flare gun. <laughs> it's like anytime they get trouble, they got to find a window so they can shoot a flare gun. <laughs> like, no, no. Member stays on duty. Like it's your job from ten to you know noon to look at the goddamn sky for hours. <laughs> a flare. So it always it, it cracks me up how it's it's kind of that type of stuff, but it you know it brings you back and it, it makes me laugh. Uh, well, it's like Star Trek with the communicators. You yeah. know, and there's plenty of uh, men like that, especially in cartoon where these, they come into the 21st century and they've got their communicators and the guys are, people are going, look at those funny old flip phones. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so, John, um, Jerry has a rule where he doesn't follow anything after 1990 <laughs> when it comes to college. <laughs> well, yeah, we're, we're the same do you have a similar rule? Do you follow up only, to a certain point or have you kept up with any like, new stuff? Only with, only with music, you know, but um, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> only music, nice. Yeah. That, I, um, I, I wouldn't go by that rule. That makes perfect sense. <laughs> well, see, when Again, when Marvel came out with the movies that they just finished with their 10-year run, that, those were my guys. Those were my heroes. Those were my guys. You know, they, I'm so glad I lived long enough to see that to see that done right. You know, they gave those guys the respect, those characters that they deserved. You know, Robert Downey Jr., I mean, come on, he was perfect. Yeah. You know, uh, but, yeah, I, I think you're going to see that in yourselves at some point, you know, you're going to stop, you know, keeping up on every single thing that comes along because you start to create your own likes and dislikes as a person. That's, that happens to every generation. That's not indicative, indicative of just one generation. Um, you know, we still think in my generation that we have the greatest music in the world. You know, I'm talking about early and mid-1960s. You know, but I appreciate good music regardless of when it was made, as long as it is as it's an actual singer songwriter. You know, that can actually sing and play. That that seems to be a priority for me. But no, um, that happens to every generation. It'll happen to you. <laughs> you know, something will start seeming stupid and weird. That's when you know it's you've turned the corner. You, know, oh, you, have to, you have to allow it, though. You have to keep up. That was the biggest thing with doing this job is 90% of it's done on the computer. All my communication now is done, you know, on Messenger and Facebook and, you know, doing things like this. And it's, uh, when I started, it was emails. Emails and literal phone calls with people. So that's even changed, you know, in, in the five or ten years. Uh, now you can, t I can talk to anybody in the world in time of life. It doesn't cost me a dime. Jerry Who's sent like, me a pitch in the other day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? It, it's, it's, uh, that's a commonality where we all share. I think. I think it's kind of nice though, like the whole, you know. I mean, I was pretty much a teenager. I mean, when I, when we had our first kid, we were 18. This was back in 2000. So back then there was no, you know, I think we had like AOL dial-up. <laughs> we, we didn't have this whole, I think Facebook was just charting. I can't even remember anymore, but there was no messenger type of thing. No Zoom video calls, you know, I, I, and it's kind of neat because you can actually like keep, in touch with people more on a daily basis than maybe back in the day. I mean, and you didn't have like, I mean, you can instantly message people now and, and call people. And back then you right. didn't, you didn't have that. Well, that's so just it. You know, it makes it easier with the clients too, because I used to have to take a photograph and this is the that old technology. I take a photograph I plug my phone, my camera into the computer, pull up the pictures, oh, shit. you know, Email paste them. And then email them, and I'd have to wait for a response. No, it's automatic. Yeah, and then you would probably have to wait a whole entire day for a response because people didn't have access on their phones, so they had to either be at work or on a computer or at home to access their email and check it. It wasn't like instantaneously. And, and to do a magazine article, you had to take it back in the 90s. I did a, an article for, I think it was Fine Scale Model or one of those, and I did photograph. Take the photographs, 
take them over to Kinko's or whatever, right? Get the prints, put them in an envelope, mail that to them. They had to look at the proofs and tell me if they were okay. I mean, it took weeks, you know, to actually see the finish. Well, I've been in real estate mm-hmm. since then, and back in the day, back in the day when we did the magazines for the real estate homes, we actually right. had templates where we had to print out the pictures and stick them on the templates where each picture would go on the section right. of the page, right. and right. we would have to mail it out to the magazine yeah. so they print it out. Yeah. It was, it's pretty crazy. I sent yeah. a, this is a this is a good quick story. I uh, back in 1996, Sideshow was still making. They made a couple of different models that they produced. And they made a model of Bernie Wrightson's Frankenstein, uh, you know, uh, one of his drawings. It's a great model. I painted it, and I took a Polaroid of it, and I mailed it to Slideshow. Because they were like, they were saying, you know, let's see your work. Let's see your stuff, you know. And I got a, about a, a month, eh, about three weeks later, I guess, I got a handwritten letter from uh, I don't know his first name, Anzalo. He's the he's the uh, CEO of Sideshow. He still is. And he said, you know, your Frankenstein kit looks great, you know, and blah, blah, blah. Keep up the great work. And it was like, holy shit. You know, this was mm-hmm. 1996 and Sideshow's, you know, actually writing me back. I still have the letter. And I still have the kit. You know, I framed the letter because it was so unusual. But right. Yeah, then, you know, you never know what, back then, you never knew if anybody even got the letter, you know, let alone, you know, respond to it so. and, and back then sideshow they were all monsters type yeah, thing, they, right? they, were, they had the universal uh, uh uh what do you call it license license, license. yeah thank you and uh, the reason they dropped that license uh, actually that uh, one from what i heard is that the uh, factories that universal wanted to, them to use had such tight safety restrictions hazard restrictions that it was so expensive for you know back then for sideshow to use it they said you know we don't even want to do the license anymore because you know and then they had to get uh, likeness approval from the actors families in a lot of cases too because side universal didn't have the license the actual you know grandkids of the actors had the license right so it was very, very convoluted back then so that's one reason they stopped doing that good for them yeah. That, that's so crazy, though, that, uh, you know, a license, I never thought about that, that a license could dictate where something is made, like that it would, it would have to be made here or there. That's that's crazy. Well, yeah, it dictates um, a lot of things. You know, they, I did uh, a work for uh, Hollywood Collectibles and I had to do a, I did a bunch of Sylvester, or Sylvester Stallone pieces and he has to approve. Them. Oh, wow. Well, the painted finished statue pictures that I took have to go to his phone and he had to look at him and go, Ugh. you know, or what? <laughs> thumbs up or thumbs down. You know, so you know Adrian, thing. check this out. Yeah, you know, you do. But you know, so yeah, that's you know, whoever holds the license has a lot of power over how it's gonna look and what they can produce. You know, right. and, and, you know a lot of it has to be um, you know, they have to be respectful of that actor or that character. So that's a big deal. Yeah, I would imagine. So that's why it, like it, it always seems like it would be so much easier just to go after, you know, comic book character type stuff rather than all these movie pieces that keep coming out because you got to get approval from the actor. It's just like, why deal with the headache? You know? <laughs> like, well, yeah, they've, they've streamlined it, you know, over the years now since, you know, all these movie licenses have come, come and gone. And it gets pretty, it gets pretty pretty quick. Uh, yeah. I had a, we had a couple of instances where I think it was New Line Pictures, and it took him two weeks to get back to us just to say yes or no. So I'm sitting on this big project for two weeks, you know. And then I realized that, you know, on the pyramid scale of what's important to these guys and what isn't, I'm way down. We're way down at the bottom. <laughs> right, they're making movies. They're spending hundreds of millions of dollars doing, you know, whatever. Right. They're okay, a, a license on some what they think is probably a very minor part of their income. You know, they'll do it during lunch or on their way home in the car. Yeah. So that's another reason when you ask me why I don't do a lot of that stuff. I didn't. That really 
put a cog in the wheels when you're you've got a full schedule for three months and you're waiting for two weeks for one person to give you a thumbs up you know on yeah. a color not even on a finished piece but on a color wow. you know? so i didn't like that <laughs> <laughs> Do you think this um, 3D printing is going to be transformative to the to statue collecting? Absolutely. I, I mean, think, uh, I think it's I think it's going to be sort of like what all these custom guys that have done custom statues kind of did to sideshow and other. It it forced them at a point to recognize that this is a income venue that might take away from their products. And it's the same thing with uh, 3D printing. Anybody can buy a printer. Anybody can learn ZBrush. Anybody can do a license. You don't need to be an ace traditional sculptor to nail a license. You need ZBrush and, and a, you know, a picture of somebody to scan and create a, create a, a very good looking statue, right? Right. And I'm on a couple of different 3D forums and 3D printing forums on Facebook. And every day there's got to be 10 or 20 new pieces printed. You know, they're selling most, for the most part, they're selling the STLs, mm -hmm. you know, files. And the rule, it's not law, but it's a rule, is that you get you can make one copy. So that's on the honor system right now. We're going to see how long that lasts. <laughs> right. right. I mean, you know. So yeah, I think that anybody that wanted to be a kid producer could be one. Though. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of scary. But um, I started to get 3D printed pieces uh, actually when I was working for the Hollywood Collectibles. Those were some of the first ones, and they were they were real interesting to paint because they were really bad. You know, because the printers didn't have the high res that they have now. Right. And, uh, you know, you have all these stair steps and lines right through the faces of these figures. And the more you're trying to smooth it off the sandpaper, they were just there all the way through because of the way the printer works, you know. Yeah. It, it does a stair step, you know, it prints up bottom to top. Do you think that uh, that helped? uh push you and make you better though because you had to deal with those imperfections you know like now yeah, it's you know, you know smoother type thing yeah it was one of those things where you know of course you know since you couldn't hand paint something you would use the airbrush you know because the airbrush would smooth that out you know hand painting uh, dragging a brush across anything you know is you have to really have a deft touch to do that well so your airbrush comes in as a you know another weapon that you can you know, get past what you're talking about, what you're talking about. So we learned, you know, we learned how to, how to you know, get around it. And then it, the printers got better. So, because mm -hmm. all these custom pieces that I've done over the last four or five years, they've all been printed. You know, it's a print and then they take that, that's the master, then they make casting uh, molds from the, from the master. And then I get, you know, casting. But they're all based off the 3D print, you know. So it all depends on how good the printer is, and, and how I, good I, the, the the file is too. Of course, from the ZBrush ZBrush artist. I got one I got question, one question, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop hogging stop everything. everything. Um, but the an earlier piece that you did, uh, you know, you said that you you sculpted the the table type type thing. Mm -hmm. Have you sculpted? A uh, entire piece, or are you interested in doing that, or no, just really painting? No. When I started out, uh, and I was just painting model kits, and I was, you know, thinking about going into it full time. I used to take a lot of kits, and I kind of kit bash, you know, add things to them, add things to the base, little things here and there, and I got pretty good at doing that. Little things like what I did to that kit, but I'm not a figure sculptor. I can. You know, add, like I said, I can sculpt this or that. I have a little bit of a background sculpting, but I was never full I would, I would think you're able to use those skills to help the clients, though, every now and then when it's to add something small, right? 
Yeah, that's just it, you know. And when you're what you the skulls the you were talking about on, uh, yeah, when you asked the McQueen. question earlier about um, doing multiple pieces for soldiers, you know, yeah, I can do three or four of the same piece, and on each piece, I try to add something different right. for each for, for each client. So there's something a little different about each one. So it's not just a cookie cutter. Mine looks just like Joe's, and Joe's looks just like bills, you know, whatever. And I think that's important if you're going to, you know, because when somebody has something painted and they get it, you know, and they pay all this money and it's a custom paint job, they don't want to see four more of them. Right? Right. You know, they don't want to see four more of them look exactly like yours. And uh, so I try to add something a little different and the sculpting ability that I have helps that a lot, you know, just to do that. And which... Joe in the chat, speaking of, since you said Joe, Joe Miller, he asked a question, which I told him I'd ask, and then I got lost, apparently, um, if he's still here. But he was asking if you ever uh, paint any anime or uh, game pieces. Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, that's a good question. The first client that I got was a huge Berserk manga fan. You guys know what that is? Taro, yes. Yes. And um, I painted for him for seven years. And that's posted that on his death, right? On Kentaro Moria's yeah. death? Yeah. Yeah. And um, he had bought all these models, you know, based on the Berserk, all these Japanese models. And I did about 35 or 40 pieces for him that were just Berserk manga pieces. And we were always adding crazy dioramas. We take books, uh, photos right out of the book, you know pages right out of the books and we recreate them so that was you know that was my my introduction into that you know world and it was a lot of fun and i learned a lot it really when you have to make things from scratch it, it really helps your, your game a lot you try to stay up on on new comic book stuff or um uh, yeah, how do you do that? Somebody comes up with a new character that well, you have to you have to be aware of pop culture all the time. Because if a character comes up with a new movie or a new character comes in that's really popular, you know there's gonna be a statue. You know there's gonna be a kit. You know, at some point something's gonna come your way that has to do with that. So you have to you know, you have to be aware of it. Um, it really helps now with Google and you know, before, back in the day, we used to have to cut pictures out of magazines and keep a file of, you know, colors and what costumes yeah. looked like. Yeah. And I had books and books of, you know, magazines. reference material. Yeah. Yeah, reference. And now yeah. it's just I can literally pull it up on my phone. Yeah, and just. <laughs> right. You know, so it's uh, really made it a lot easier. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm going to call it a night, guys. <laughs> I've been up since like 4 a.m. and I'm like fighting the sleep. <laughs> I really nice wish I could stay you. longer, but I was enjoying this conversation. Too. Nice to see you, and you have a great collection. No, it was nice meeting you. Thank Philosophy. you. I, I would definitely like to chat with you next time more because I, I really wanted to stay. But I've been up since like 4 a.m. and I'm like trying to fight this. <laughs> Thank awesome. you, guys. Have a good night. It was nice meeting you, John. Bye. Good night, Barb. Bye. I just realized I was muted the entire time I was talking to you. Um, she takes really <laughs> nice photos, too. Pardon? Barbara takes really nice photos, too, if you, if you yeah, see she's, her. Yeah, I've, I've looked at her collection before. Oh, cool. cool, cool. She's got a nice photo. Uh, Every nice... time I take a photo with my camera my camera phone and then she takes one, I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's not it's an art. It's like everything else. You know? Yeah, for sure. It's it's, it's one that I'm for. It's foreign to me. You know, you build all these, you know, great display cases and then you know, you take a photo that's not up to par. And then, it, you know, it's like people look at it and they go, mm. you know, you're like, Whoa. <laughs> you know, that's my... I'm curious, is there a, stat, a licensed statue? And the only reason I say that is because it kind of limits the, uh, the the pool to choose from that you'd love to repaint. Not saying that the paint job is bad, but it's just something you'd love to paint, to do your own spin on. Well, you know, I, I get to do that. I mean, the Thanos on the throne... You know, I know oh, right. that's I a, yeah. thought that could be something that somebody would send me and say, repaint it. 
because yeah. it's a yeah. piece. It's fantastic. Yeah, you know, and it's like, man, it's like almost you almost didn't want to touch it because you have to make it look as good or better for the client every time. It's a lot of pressure, right? <laughs> I mean, I mean, like I sweating as you're doing it? I couldn't really do that. I had to make it look different. Yeah. You know, so we went with more kind of warm tones. Um, you know, the skulls were done differently. The back of the throne was differently. And luckily, he wanted a comic, Thanos comic colors. The different, the higher... Uh, Shinier gold, the lighter gold. Yeah, yeah, the more, the yeah, the more blue. yellowish gold. Oh, yeah. That solved the problem, right there. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's mostly Captain. When I see a Captain America, you know, that's done a certain way, like that one that you showed before, Jerry. You know, with the Falcon head. I like that stealth look. I wish they would have came out with a real stealth version of that statue. Speaking of Franco, <laughs> there he is. <laughs> He's a friend of ours. He's, 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 right. he's Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, mean, I didn't mean to interrupt. Dude. But anyways, yeah, you know, it's a, a lot of times I, when I buy something, you know, as a collector, you just hope it's, it's going to be acceptable when you pull it out of the box. But you got to admit, they've gotten better. You know, even in the last five years, they've all gotten better. The, when the companies like XM and Prime One came in, Sideshow up their game. They had to. Yeah. They had to start competing again. They had cornered the market on the whole thing. And that, that brings up an interesting question. I don't know if Jerry wants to dig in this, or and maybe John doesn't want to dig in this, but <clears throat> is there a company, a statue company that lean more that you lean more toward as far as preferences? You know, with art direction sculpt, or is it kind of or does it depend on the piece? I mean, you've got Jerry. You've got all kinds for all different companies, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's got a yeah. yeah I'm, I'm, right there. Yeah, I've got. I'm all over the place. So yeah. I I, uh, I have XM. I have uh, Sideshow. Right. I have lots of customs. I think. Uh, okay, so those two are Legendary Beast there. Right. XM right. And Legendary Beast, but those two are custom over there. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I'm bad with the mirror. Jerry's effect. biggest problem yeah. is saying no to statues. Yeah, that's a big problem. <laughs> well, I think I'm getting better. We've all been there. I think I'm. I think I. I think I'm starting to become more discerning and slowing Wind down. down. Yeah, I think you will. You know, it's it's that thing where when you first get into it, you want to buy everything. You know, right. You got the money. You, it's like you know, everything looks cool, and then after a while, you go, wait a minute. Yeah. You know. And then you start to really look at them. They all look nice, but there's going to be one that really jumps out to you and says, you know, that's the one I want in the collection. Right, right, right. Yeah, I got away from a while. I got away from the whole pop culture thing. These guys give me the business because I don't really watch any of the new the new MCU stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I, I owned a comic book shop back in the 80s. and oh, cool. I. Uh, and I was really involved, and then, and then, you know, my I used to say it, nothing after 1990 because that's kind of where I disappeared, and then I came back recently. And um, you know, back then I didn't have the money. Uh, I thought Bowens were crazy expensive at 100 and 200, uh, 200 and 300 dollars, right. and um, and then I got to the point. Uh, where I could afford this stuff, and I kind of went crazy in the past few years, <laughs> and uh, so, but I'm slowing down now. Yeah, that was similar to me back in the day. I couldn't afford anything. Right. You know, I had made a list of all the stuff that I wanted to buy someday, and I, where I could still find it. And then when I got some disposable income, I started to, you know, collect those things. So. <laughs> Thought you guys might enjoy that banter. <laughs> Very nice. I'm, I'm just kind of looking over through the chat. Yeah, Edwin Diaz is uh he's a he's a good supporter of ours. He's he's here in the chat and he's a uh, he's he's probably more of our contemporary John than than these other guys. Uh, so let me ask you how this works. There's people are they listening to the chat? Yeah, they're watching the, the watching the show live. So, so so John, we use this so. YouTube at one point made it so that you have to have a certain amount of subscribers to be uh-huh. able to have multiple people on when you stream from your channel. Right. StreamYard lets you do it through StreamYard, and then it just streams it to Facebook. To I'm sorry, to YouTube. 
Oh, so this is yeah. kind of a workaround, really. Gotcha. Yeah, so we're live on YouTube right now. I got you. And when I put comments on there, I'm just kind of throwing them up on the screen for nice. laughs or usually it's to make fun of one of us. Usually it's aimed at me, but, you know, I'm used to it, so. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, people would have, have asked me to do a YouTube channel, and I have one, but I, it, it takes time. Like, yeah. I mean, when I'm doing this, I don't have time to set that up and talk, you know, talk while I'm coming. Yeah. You know, so do you, do you focus on, is it's Facebook, right? You don't do like Instagram or ArtStation no, or I anything? do Instagram, but it's just stuff that I want to show. I don't do any of my, every so often I'll show something I'm working on, but it's not there for this purpose. You know? So if I wanted to show off your stuff in the chat, I would just paste your Facebook then? Your Facebook link? Is that right? Yeah. 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 I've got multiple this albums. This is me doing it, not you, so you don't have to feel self-conscious about it. <laughs> Yeah, there's multiple albums in my photos of all the work. Okay. Because I actually did it a while ago, so I'm glad I asked now. No, that's fine. <laughs> I didn't think you cared, though. I just thought about it now. Like, oh, shit, No, I there's really a couple, couple of Instagram uh, guys that just all of a sudden my work shows up on their site, you know, and uh, I didn't have anything to do with it. So. You know what Aren't annoys you, me? When nice you take an Instagram me. picture... And then in order to get in there, because like, the photos are all like, what, four by three or, or, or perfect squares, and you've got to like pinch it, and even when you pinch right. it, it doesn't right. zoom out, and you're like, what right. the, f I have to take the picture again, you jerks. Well, it's like Facebook doing a horizontal venue for your oh, picture. Like a landscape? And everything on your phone is vertical. What the hell is yeah. that? You know, you take a picture with a phone, and now you got to somehow put it, you know, I'm talking about your back uh, page, the photo behind your Facebook, you know. Oh, yeah, the, the I think it's called the yeah. profile banner or something, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, it's horizontal. You can't put anything from your phone on. Yeah, it's got to be a like landscape. Yeah, it's got to be a landscape. So it's, it's kind of stupid. But. Yeah. It's even worse on Instagram, though, because, like, I feel like maybe, and it's maybe just because I take a lot of landscape pictures, that when I go on there to post my some of my statues on Instagram, you know, just to share stuff, I'm always just frustrated. Like, now i got to take the yeah, effing picture again. Not, that is, you know, they say that Instagram is a mobile format. It's not really made for the computer. It's really, you know, about people on their this. So it doesn't, work, it doesn't function the same, you know, on your computer as it does on your phone. It's a lot more user friendly on the phone, I think. Than, yeah, you know. for sure. I think there's even like functions available on phone. No, I guess. No, I think they yeah, there are, there are a few different functions on the phone. That you yeah, can. yeah. I don't know if they changed that recently, but yeah, there was like stuff you can only do on your phone and not and not the app or the site. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, I don't use it for any of my stuff. Right. What are you saying, Ark? Uh, a lot of this, uh, you know, technology, the way it's gotten, I like before we started the show and Jerry was asking me, you know, to, to go ahead and start the, or, or send the link and type stuff. And I'm just like, I don't know how to do that. And so it's, it, I couldn't imagine, especially, you know, if you're trying to put out pictures of projects and stuff like that, I mean, you're, you're focused on your, your artwork and, and things like that. And then trying to also keep up with the newest trends to keep your stuff out there. I mean, it, it, today it's like, like I asked before, you know, when you started out, if you had to kind of put yourself out there and stuff, as far as today, are you even considering new clients, or do you have such a big fan base now that, that you're pretty much set? Well, I, I've been booked out for six months in advance for 10 okay. years. So, you know, and I'm just saying that to give you an idea. Right, that pretty much says it all. Yeah, so, you know, and I have a lot of, I have a, a handful of long-term clients that I've worked with for over 10 years. Um, and that always helps fill the blanks. There's always somebody that wants something done. I usually get, and I'm not, you know, I'm just answering your question. Almost every day somebody asks me, you know, about getting a commission piece done. And um, so it's a great position to be in as a painter to have the luxury of that many people wanting your work. But it's also part of the fact that there's not that many good painters out there. 
Okay. Yeah. There's a handful of guys. Right. And not, not a lot of them do it full time like I do either. You know, you have to send in a piece and wait and hope it gets done this year. <laughs> and right. Over and over. So that's, you know, I, and even from my own perspective, I have to look at it like that too. That there's an advantage to being available, you know, and and being here and, and being able to schedule something and saying, you got this week, it's going to be done on this day and sticking to that. That's a big advantage over a lot of these guys. It doesn't take away anything uh, from their talent. There's guys out there that are a lot better than me, but because they can't do that, I think it limits their ability to get as many clients as I have. Right, which which we were we were kind of you know discussed a little bit before the show went live, how you know you were saying that you do this full time, and I was saying how awesome that was because I'm sure there are a lot of painters out there that would love to do it full time, but they they keep that you know the other job type type thing. So it, it's awesome that you know you're you're so on it that you've got that weight. I mean that that weight is a good thing. It lets you know one that you're doing a great job for sure. Like Franco, I know you know he sculpts. He's I think sculpting is still a part-time job for him. His other job is he's a gigolo. And I think that distracts him a lot of time from, uh, from yeah, more work that he could do. I think one's more, <laughs> one's more pleasurable than the other. <laughs> <laughs> it's the painting. If you've seen his clients, I mean, my mother's a repeat customer. I mean, he's got to enjoy the, the sculpting. You know, I got to say, that, that was a good segue. <laughs> But no, you know, that's that's the whole thing. It's uh, to do anything creative, even a little bit creative like what I do, you have to love it. Because yeah. it's gonna show it's gonna show in the finished product. And if you don't, you know, because I've seen a lot of guys fall by the wayside, you know, they, they can't juggle it all. They can't work full time, they can't raise the kids. Uh, I had clients that were great clients and then they got married and they had a kid and that was the end of it. Yeah, I bet. You know, and then they came back 10 years later because the kid had grown up. Yeah. Seriously. So, you know. yeah. so, John, John, with, with all these pieces that are constantly coming in or pieces that are, you know, people are wanting to get done, do you have, like I know you said, you know, you have to take breaks and stuff like that. You'll go on vacation and whatnot. But do you have other, you know, like a garage kit that you enjoy? That you're like, I got to take a break from this and work on something that just strictly I enjoy. I've got full control, full focus. Is, is there anything like that going on, or are you so, so well, so busy that you got to stay focused on everybody else's? I think it's the thing where when you're in the eye of the hurricane, you know, you got to focus on how good it is right now. Right. Uh, when I retire, if I ever retire, uh, I've got a. Uh, stash of kits and things that I want to do for myself and ideas, you know, that I've, you know, been working on for years that I just want to do for myself. That's cool. And, uh, uh, that, that's nice. Yeah. I'll it's do those, passion. And, you know, and, you know, my girlfriend and I, Terry, we've talked about that as far as as we get older, we're going to spend more time doing things, you know, that we want to do, obviously. And instead of scheduling out a full month of jobs for clients, I'll give myself a week or two weeks just to do whatever the hell I want, you know, to paint whatever the hell I want, you know, so that makes it, you know, kind of into what you're talking about, you know, I'm kind of transitioned more into that as I get older. So. Right. John, I'm curious what you did before. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go, uh, back. go, go, Brian. go ahead. Mine's kind of changing the subject. So if you want to follow up with your question, go ahead. My, mine is changing the subject also. So go ahead. <laughs> All right. Well, you're so kind. So uh, I'm curious. I'm curious what you did before painting, and if you don't want to talk about that, that's perfectly fine too. If that's too personal, no, that's fine. It was. Um, I was in graphic uh, graphic design work. I worked for. I figured it was something. Four different graphic shops over the years. More industrial. I did industrial. I did fine art. I did uh, textile work, screen printing, and printing. And I also did the um, high-end home theater. Oh, nice. Uh, that explains a lot, John. I was in sales in, uh, <coughs> excuse me, system design. Oh, cool. And we would do, you know, like high-end 
hundred thousand dollar home theaters, you know, and million dollar homes, you know, big, big projects. So I did that, and I loved that because that was kind of I could take my love of film and you know that yeah. and get you know get near it. Take it to another level, yeah. The graphics was just trying to stay in art, you know. I always love doing what I'm doing now, and I, I did it for a hobby all those years, but I, you couldn't do it as a business, you know. So I got into these graphic shops, and I, I ran a, a printing press for a couple of years for a fine art company here in uh, Tempe, and it was great because I we had to custom mix every color. You get a painting that had hundreds of colors on it, and you break it down to maybe 150 colors. And those 150 colors had to be silk screened on the print, you know, because we make a limited edition print. So I had to custom match every single one of those colors. So I custom by eye matched thousands of colors over a couple of years to the point to where I can look at any color to this day and match it. You know, you oh, nice. at it. unique skill, dude. You know, so I don't have to yeah. buy 500 bottles of blue and red. Or go to or go to Home Depot and have that like laser thing. Yeah, <laughs> I don't have to do that. Just, you know, I've got about 25 or 30 basic colors, and I pull everything from those. Right, right, right. John did that laser thing. <laughs> they they yeah. got John yeah. and yeah. under a yeah. cabinet they somewhere. They coded it off of John's brain. Yeah, it just made it a lot easier. And I didn't know I had that skill. You know, when you're doing it, you don't think about wow. it. As I got into this more, I'd be like, well, I can match that color. You know, it's this, this, and this. And so it was, a, it was a, a, a great thing to be able to learn. Uh, so we got I'm a just going to ask Forensi's question. Oh, go ahead. I'll, we'll, we'll pause. Uh, so Forensi asked, uh, what was the, and, and you don't have to give the dollar amounts, or, or you can kind of maybe just, it, unless you unless you feel comfortable doing that, but most expensive statue you painted, I, I guess more, I would, I would kind of gear it towards what was the most intricate and most work for you that you've done so far. Oh, honestly, that one that I just finished. Oh, that, that, yeah. uh, it's Snow three, White. Eagle Queen and Snow White. Three parts in it. Wow. And I had to, you know, assemble and paint every single part. Um, there's been a couple of um, those large custom pieces, you know, like the uh, Wolverine on the um, on the Sentinel. The sen on the Sentinel. Right. Uh, plus the back three. of the Sentinel had hundreds of pieces in it, you know, that had to be painted. Um, you know, Thanos on throne, Doom on any, anything with like Doom on the throne, whereas, whereas there's this elaborate sculpting all over it, you know, uh, things like that. And you have to put a, not only do you have to paint it, you have to put a different spin on it. So that it's a double challenge. You're not just repainting it, you're trying to do what, you know, the client wants or making it better. Right, right. If you had to show up. You know, Sorry. Yeah, so it's not so much the complexity of the job as it is what the client wants on that particular job that makes it complex. You know, how much they want to change it. Right. Some things you can't, you know, there's certain jobs I just say, no, I can't do it. Yeah. You know, that's not going to look good. You're not going to get anything. You know, you're not going to get a good return on that. You know, if so you have Go ahead. If you had if one, you had one that, uh, that uh, if someone was if like, someone was like, you know, get, sh show me your best piece that shows everything you got. Do you have one piece in mind, or it, would you have to show kind of a a collection thing? Especially because I know you got to paint, you know, to the the person that owns the piece. But do you have one piece yeah. in mind that you're like that right there shows what I'm made of? It's a double question, you know. Um, I'll see stuff from other painters that I look at and it's great and I know it's great when I say when I can't think of anything I change right Interesting. or I'd say I might do something different but I wouldn't change it so but I it's know like, it's like nitpicky so to speak yeah if I get that yeah. picky if I, don't, if I don't just see something right away that I don't like then I know that's, that's a great paint job so 
I have certain pieces like that that I've painted over the years that are like, like you said, that's the, that's the hallmark of that. That's the best I've done on that character. So yeah, you know, if somebody's asking me about, you know, did you ever paint Wolverine? Well, yeah. You want to see one? I'll show you one. I'm going to show them that. <laughs> nice. You know, because obviously a lot of times um, you can only, what do they say, you can't make a, a silk purse out of a sow's ear. You know, it's an old saying, but you can't, if something is Very shitty, yeah. you can only do so much with it. If it's a bad sculpt or a bad casting or a bad likeness, I can only bring it along so far. You know, sometimes you can save them. Sometimes the paint job can save a piece. Uh, sometimes, you know, and those are those those jobs where I tell the guy, you know, I'm probably going to pass. So, so Walton asked here, um, is there is there a license piece that you know that you kind of looked at and said, I would really like to get a hold of that and redo it? Um, there's been a couple like that. He yeah. also rephrased his question here. He said, uh, not to cut in, sorry. He said, uh, I just meant if out of any of the Sideshow, Prime 1 or um, XM that he may have chosen to repaint either because he was inside of or unsatisfied or wanted to take a different direction. Um, that's not a question. Though. What He meant in, in relation to what? What was the question? <laughs> No, that's no, great, that, I, I that, think, I think he's asking, question. I think he's asking, is there a piece that, and if you don't want, if we're putting you on the spot, you know, on to answer that's, but is there, is there oh. something, is there a piece out there that you could say, I really, I'd really like to get a hold of that and repaint it? I think for it was somewhere to my question. For yeah. myself or? Sure. Let's say that. Yeah. Sure. Well, again, like that. Thanos on throne. You know, that's the, I think that's really the perfect example. For anything from Prime One or XM, they do great paint jobs. You're not gonna. I'm not gonna see a lot of those. You know, and I know that because I've people have sent them to me, and I've made minor adjustments to the paint job. These guys, you know, they said, "Hey, this is gonna be fifteen hundred dollars, and here's why." You know, they went from sideshow seven hundred and fifty dollars statues. To saying it's going to be fifteen hundred dollars, and the prototype, your or your, your factory paint job that you get when you open that box is going to look just like the prototype. You know, they they narrowed that line between the prototype and the factory paint job very well. So, you know, that's really the thing. Uh, I I don't get a lot of prepaints anymore because of that, and because Sideshow stepped their game up. You know, I don't see it too often, unless you're just going to like take it in a totally different direction, like that Captain America. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. I wasn't. We changed the suit entirely. Suit. Yeah. So, so yeah, you know, and I think that's a good thing. You know, I think that's good. You should, you know, the whole thing with with painting a prototype and working for a company like that is that they want that prototype to knock your socks off. They want you to do it 120 percent. And then they send it to the factory and they say, do as, well, do as close to this as you can, given you have to paint 5,000 pieces in a limited amount of time. Right? Right. And it's crazy. It's crazy. And the factory, you know, it, this is piecework. You got these people sitting there all day painting legs, painting heads. You know what I mean? That's all they do all day, you know. So, if you've ever done any kind of factory work like that or piece work, I, I've done that. And, you know, you've got 5,000 pieces that have to be done by Friday. And after that, you've got 5,000 pieces coming the next week and the next week and the next week. And there's a schedule that you have to keep going on. You know, and you've got to get this stuff out. And I don't care what we think about it being art, but it's also, you know, it's a job. Right. It's, right, it's for a lot sure, of work. Sure. So, right. you know, every so often something comes through that just looks bad, you know. And, you know, give them a break. You know, that's a hard <laughs> yeah. job to be consistent on. It's hard for me to paint one. Think uh, about painting five ten, whatever the run is, you know, for something. I know, I know talking to Lewis, when he's done a couple of prototypes, he's kind of been like, oh my, or no, actually, not even prototypes. He did some 
custom repaints and he'd only do so many. Right. And I think they were, I think he said that yellow was his least favorite color. Yeah, or I about that. Yeah, we <laughs> it was just funny. It was like, oh shit, I never thought of that. You know, like, yeah, there's, there's certain things that are, you know, certain areas, uh, certain colors <clears throat> are more difficult to, to do than others. But the more you paint, the more you learn, uh, you know, what, what to put under those colors to make a pop. Right. You get that experience you know. and such, right? Yeah, that's just painting, you know. Right, here. right. You want me to answer this question? Yeah, I, I popped it up here. I was, I was going to get to it, and I, I didn't know if Jerry wanted to hit this. One of the guys in the chat said, which airbrush or brand or paint brands would you recommend? Well, um, that's a really loaded question, again. Uh, there's a lot of good airbrush paint out there. Okay. That you, can use. Uh, you can find it uh, on the chat groups on Facebook, you know. You can find it on Amazon. You can get almost anything on Amazon now. Um, I use a lot of acrylic paint, and I custom mix all, almost about 70% of my colors are custom mixed. They're not out of a bottle, per se. Okay. Uh, and that's because, you know, I, I believe that everybody has, if you look at all four of us here on the screen, everybody's got a different skin tone. Now, I don't want to see... A painter paint the same, you know, flesh tone on four jobs in a row, right? You don't want, you know, right. you know, he's just pulling it out of a bottle. To me, that's not a custom paint job, right? Right. Mm -hmm. You know what hey, I did? I take my shirt off, it's like Jerry. I don't want to. Do, I don't want to see that. So, <laughs> I think it's no, no, actually, nobody does. <laughs> Especially my wife. My wife's like, go to bed with your shirt on, please. <laughs> <laughs> Too much information. <laughs> but no, you know, it's that it's that kind of thing. Anyways, on the brand, the airbrushes, I have a couple of Badger airbrushes, uh, but my mainstays are Iwatas. They're uh, very expensive, but they're, they're workhorses. I paint almost every day. I rarely take a day off. I, I might go in for a couple hours. That's the curse of being having a studio in your house, you know. It's like, well, I could just go in for an hour, you know, three hours later but um, everything has to hold up if you do it as a business as a job you have to use industrial grade equipment so you know I try to buy the best airbrush the best compressor you know I have a, I had a custom booth made when the job started getting really big mm -hmm. you know the last four or five years he's bases and everybody's got to have a throne right, right. you know like everybody's got a throne to stand on so i had to get a custom uh airbrush booth made to accommodate the sizes of these things i think that's starting to turn around though the i hope so well not with the thing that i just sent you but <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, no, you know it's um it's difficult. I mean, that, uh, see, I'm doing the same thing, Jerry. Your yeah. picture is backwards on here. Right. So it's, it's not, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's like not a mirror. You, you think it's going to behave yeah. like a mirror, and it's not. So the juggernaut not. weighs in at almost 75 pounds. Oh, my goodness. That's ridiculous. It weighs yeah. 75 pounds? No, it resin, as far as I can tell. Wow. And I only have two statues that are heavier than that. Just, well, I don't know if you guys, if you have this, but you can see it. How big this oh shit! Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Whoa! It's like literally a third. Here's the hand. Wow! God oh my dang. goodness! Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit! It's as big as my hand. It's bigger than my hand. Wow! So most of the hulks are like that. <clears throat> you know, they've got that distorted um, anatomy where the hands are huge. You yeah. Know, head's tiny, like a little pinhead. Yeah, the, the XM Red Hulk's the same way. This one right yeah, where my finger is yeah. at. I put my fist next to it, and I'm like, man. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's... The arc it's feels like it every night. It's difficult to paint stuff like that, too, because you really have to... You know, I'm holding something that weighs about 40 or 50 pounds, uh, kind of balancing it on the workstation, and I'm going in with a brush, and I'm trying to be really intricate. Yeah. You know, without just it falling over. Right. So... 
So yeah, it's. Uh, I hope they get a vertical. <laughs> and then you buy it, and where do you put it? Right. Especially, you know. I mean, shelves. You know, people's displays. I mean, most people use you know IKEA systems or whatever they're made to, you know, hold clothes or whatnot. And you've got a statue that's seventy-five pounds. It's like, how's it supposed to support it? It's crazy. Yeah, I, I had those. <clears throat> excuse me, I had those for a while. <clears throat> excuse me. You're good. I haven't talked this much in a long time. <laughs> we artists, we don't. You must have a ton of space for boxes and stuff. Do you, do well, you, do I you have I had boxes a, for your collection? Yeah, a 10 by 20, you know, storage unit. But we, okay. I have a rule now where it's one in, one out. If I buy something, I got to sell something. So the amount doesn't vary anymore. <coughs> I, I, I maxed out, so I, uh -huh. if I buy two, I got to sell two. So Franco actually had a question Franco. for you. Um, Are you going to say that question yeah. there, right? I was going to, and then I was like, I yeah, was, I like my that. throat was scratchy too, I so like I was kind of giving, and it looked like John was reading, so I was like, you know what? Why don't I not screw this up and just let him read it? <laughs> Does everybody see that, or do, they, do you have to? Talk? No, they all, they all see, yeah. Everything that you see, you So can I answer it? Sure. Yeah, go ahead, sure. Um, to me, and he'll he'll appreciate this. To me, it depends on the scope. If if it's sculpted well, you know, I bought. If you saw my collection, I bought stuff all over the map. I don't have a particular genre. I don't have a particular character. If if it's a beautiful sculpture, you know, I'll, I'll be gravitated toward it. Toward it. You know, I've got I've got custom handmade dolls dolls in my collection. I've got one-of-kind masks, you know, that uh, special effects guys have uh, have made. I've got uh, commissioned oil paintings of, uh, you know, classic monsters that I've had people, you know, make for me one-of-a-kind. I have a lot of a one-of-kind pieces. My so, daughter and my mom think it's funny to refer to my statues as dolls. Any advice there? Yeah, I know. It's like, you know <laughs> <laughs> they think it's funny. My mom got my daughter saying it. Because she's a jerk. <laughs> what it's, funny. it's funny that Franco asked that question, you know, preferring gender, because Franco, he makes his own gender when he sculpts his, his monsters. <laughs> Again, oh, yeah, his monsters are creepy as shit. He's got that right now. But, uh, no, you know, it's, uh, it doesn't matter what it is. If it's done well done, then I, I'm, I, I gravitate toward it. I've got a pretty eclectic collection. I've got probably over, I don't know, 400, 500 pieces in my house. Right. You know, a lot of one of a kinds, you know. I look at artists, you know, that I like, and I, it's like I want to get one piece from that particular artist, you know. And that's a good way to support. Sculptor or painter that you're saying? Sculptor or painter, it doesn't matter. What that's cool. That's really cool. And I, you know, I like to support those guys because, we're you know, artists are not supported. You know, we everybody looks at it as a luxury and something that only rich people, you know, can buy. Well, it's funny because, like, you look at Prime One, and I, I love their statues, but one of the things that kind of annoys me, besides, like, them creating bases that are like, you know, fuck your display, we're just going to make this <laughs> as big as we want, but, like, they don't really advertise their painters or sculptors. And I, I think they're starting to now with a lot of the... since yeah, COVID. I don't think they started out as like sideshow did right which is a bunch was just a bunch of creative guys that wanted to do something cool right you know tom galillan he's the creative director of sideshow started out working at a hobby shop a hobby shop in california he's the current creative director yeah no cool. the current. he's been the creative director since they started okay the guy with the big mustache you know <laughs> all the uh Court of the Dead stuff. He's always on this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I know you're talking about real, real skinny dad. Yeah. 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 He's been with, from the okay. start, and they discovered him. You know, working in a hobby shop. You know, he used to build the garage kits like I did when he started out. And, uh, you know, just kind of went up, went up that path. But um, no, I'm just reading some of this stuff. Oh, sorry. I'm just. I wasn't trying to distract you. I was just throwing stuff up there that people might want to 
so, so entertained by the chatter. Next week, right, Jerry? What's up? Thor starts next week, right? Right, right. Yeah. yeah. And I'm really looking forward to it, too. So, so John, if, if you were not painting nonstop, which I, I'm to be doing this this long, I'm sure you love it. But if you were not painting, is there something else that you were like, uh, you know, have maybe a tiny regret that you went in a different path? Or is it strictly painting? Painting is it. No, two things. Um, I would have, would have liked to have been a musician. Um, I did dabbled in that a little bit when I was young, and we were pretty good. We toured around the Midwest. and we Hence the guitar, right? Yeah, we opened for some high-end bands, you know. And I used to jam with, you know, guys, a guy from Journey. You know, oh, shit, yeah, really? Neil Sean? Yeah. You know, uh, John, John, Jonathan Kane. Oh, yeah? Yeah. We went to the same high school. Oh, cool. Nice. Hey. Nice. That's cool. You know, I would have... Name drops. Or, 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 yeah, or got into um, film, you know, directing or editing. I mean, I love that. I still love it. I still... There's nothing like going to a movie, sitting in a big theater and watching a film. You know, it's nothing like it. So, so on, on that same note with theater, right? So you were saying at one point you you would help people with their uh, their home theater. Do you have a home theater at your house? I do. Yeah, nice. have you seen it? Have a, He's got some kick-ass speakers too. I even first time I yeah. contacted John, I was because yeah. I'm big into headphones and focals. You know, I like speakers nice. too, yeah. but like the headphones are more or more or more my speed right even for for movie watching yeah yeah you know if you want to listen you have to have good phones i used to have and a I, really good pair of sennheisers yeah. yeah i have these are sennheisers right now and i've got some of their top end ones in the back and focal so i'm i, I dabble too you know in this stuff and right. so when, when i saw those i was like i think i messaged you yeah, i know oh, those nice are focals aren't they <laughs> acknowledge you know acknowledge them but to answer your question being in a a business like that, you know, you can get everything at cost. Right. So um, that's one of the things I did. I was able to put together a, a pretty high-end system for half price. Right. And, and I listened to that system for about 20 years. Nice. And, um, I'm jealous. It's been about 21 years now since I was in that, since I, you know, kind of retired and started doing this. Fuck. And. Um, yeah, so it was it was great, and uh, I took that stuff from our old house. We made the home theater here. You know, we've got we got a pretty nice system. It it uh, it does what it's supposed to do. It's it's designed for cinema, right? It's not designed for music. You know, you have a very nice for, system for a cinema sound. And John's being a, very humble. He has a very nice system. <laughs> what is it? Nine, nine, nine point two. Oh shit! You got the the Atmos so type. I've got. Right? Full Atmos, you know, yeah. all the way around. I've the got ceilings and the ceiling ones and 12, everything. Twelve, yeah, I've got twelve inch and ten inch sub. Uh, oh, nice. Left, left, center, right. Uh, two surrounds on the sides and two surrounds in the back. Is this in the same room that you're in, or is it a different room? No, it's different story. Because it yeah. looks like you have a receiver right behind you on that third rack. That's all the stuff that powers the home theater. It's all. Oh, in the other room. Oh, yeah. It's all. We got a universal remote. Oh, that's you know, wild. You know, I and it controls everything in here. Curious, what what uh universal remote do you use? Harmony? Uh, it's uh from Universal Remote Control Company. I didn't know that's that. Universal, universal Remote. I usually use Harmony or yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Very cool. Yeah, I used to uh, all the stuff you're talking about is just wow. Yeah, I was gonna say I'm not gonna try to steer it too much in that direction. When I was in home theater, I used to program all the remotes for the clients. Yeah. You know, the, the custom remotes because they've had to work everything in different rooms. Right, right, right. So I know how to, you know, I still know how to do that. But, but I have a, we have an 80 inch uh, sharp, you know, which is sharp TV. Good. I mean, that's not like, you know, you can get a, what, a 95 inch, you know? But, uh, you know, really? it, it does the I know job. You can get an 80 or 85 yeah. pretty easily, yeah. So, yeah. so do you prefer, and I know we're, we are so far off statues and I'm, I don't know if, if that's my curious, curious looking impatient and whatever, but like this stuff, like before I had a statue room, I had a movie theater room. So I'm, I'm so like, now I'm like, I want to pick your mind and type stuff. You're saying you're, you're, if I could not drink so much, you're, you're talking about TVs at this point. Do you prefer having a big TV over a projector? 
Well, it depends on the room. And it depends yeah. on the distance that, you know, you have to throw that image from a projector. The projectors yeah. have gotten, you know, from when I worked in it, they've got, you know, light years better. And right. less, a little less expensive. But you can buy for under probably two grand, uh, 85 or 90 inch screen that'll blow your socks off, you know. And you can put together a sound system for literally a couple of grand that'll blow your socks off again. Yeah. Where when I was in it, you'd have to <clears throat> spend 20, 25,000 to get that same oh, sound. Wow. wow, that's crazy. Yeah, it's, gotten, it's gotten so less expensive now, you know. So, yeah, there's, and there's, you know, you don't have to go, we were a boutique store, you know what I mean? We were high end, snobby. All these guys worked in, they were musicians, ex musicians, and ex, you know, record producers, and they, you know, right, they were like, you know, about everything. So, yeah, you don't need to do that anymore. Yeah, they charge you to get in the room, you know, just to walk in. You know, you have to swipe your credit card. <laughs> it's it's so exciting though, because like 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 you're you're a great painter now, but you you've also got you know other things that you're you know, an expert in like the, the movie theater type stuff. And so I, I've, I've really, personally, I, I've really enjoyed you being on, um, kind of thank thank brand type, type stuff. Great job, Jerry, with the, with the guest pick. <laughs> <laughs> that's the well, trouble. I didn't really have to do any work. Yeah. That's the trouble with artists that you sit and paint by themselves all day. You know, if you, if you want to work them, you can't get them back in the bottle. It's impossible. You won't show them. It's been fantastic and fascinating because, like I said before, like this is totally outside my uh, my knowledge set or, or my it's skill set. Just to get a perspective, you know, of you know <clears throat> what we do. Just like if you had a sculptor in here, right, or uh, you know, a, a kit producer, they all have their, you know, their their place in this thing that we love. Well, it's funny. I'm more like I was saying. I'm more analytical, but as you can see from my man cave. You know, it's all it's all artsy stuff because mm -hmm. I guess it's just my appeal because it's stuff I can't do and I, you know, that, the characters uh, I love, yeah. so it, it's really neat. No, that's that's exact. I get that. I understand that because there's we all have that where you look at something and you go, "How do you do that? I can't believe you can do that." Yeah, yeah. yeah. An, uh, IT computer guy, something's wrong. We call him and he comes over and he, you know, he's sitting here hitting the keyboard, right, doing right. all this stuff, and it's like. I lost him at you know twenty minutes ago. As far as what he's doing, but right, right, right. Yeah, so everybody has their speciality. For sure. I, I still haven't found mine, and, and my wife is constantly reminding me that I don't have one. So I I'm still searching. It, I think it should be a stand-up. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe jet boating through Maybe the uh, countryside. My wife has recommended a stand up at like at a stop sign corner or something like that. But I, but I would have to pay with people. A, like, a large sombrero upside down that? for a big, big cardboard sign, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. Need just, money for stats for a just the thing. Need money to tell jokes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. yeah, I really enjoyed having someone on who knows who Bernie Wrightson and Jim Steranko <laughs> is. <laughs> Okay. I knew Steranko. I did not know Bernie Wrights for it to, to be uh, <laughs> to be forthright. I, I didn't know either, either one. So, oh, you will. Okay. I'll, I'll I'll give I'll put you on a reading list. Yeah. Uh, you know the reading list. Like like I said, we, we were going back to Fantastic Four. It was made in the '60s, and they did some kind of cheesy stuff at the time. But even in Uncanny X Men with Stan Lee and uh, Jack Kirby. How they would incorporate them in the stories where they would like at certain points they would have the comics kind of run through the the writer's room yeah, and Stanley right. be held hostage stuff. To me, in the comics, it seems so cheesy, but they do the same thing in all the Marvel movies, right? Like with all the Stanley things, and everybody's like, like yeah, so. it, it, it's so natural in the movies, but in the the comics, it's it's, it's such different times that it, it kind of it still blows my mind and. Yeah, I but guess, like, you know, it's one of those things where you had to be there, you know. If you were yeah. a kid that was born in the 50s or the early 60s and you saw that stuff for the first time and you read it, it blew our minds. I mean, mm -hmm. it literally blew our minds. There was nothing like it, especially yeah. in Marvel. 
the Marvel world, you know, the things that Stan Lee came up with and Jack Kirby. Right. You know, they were, that's, they were the forefathers of all the stuff that we're enjoying now. Yeah. They started all this yep. stuff. Which I would much rather be in that time frame than the people that are making millions now from shaking their butt on Twitter or doing something goofy on Twitter. I, 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 I was born in the wrong generation. <laughs> so. Well, that's it. You know, that's when I was talking about singer songwriters, you know, right? And people that can actually play instruments and can, you know, stand up on stage and just sing. Right. What they use that mm -hmm. auto tune shit that some people use now. You know, without somebody, <laughs> you know, tuning them, keeping them on tune on the, on the exactly on the, on the board, you know. Yeah. Like I mean, when I, I'm like y'all when I when I go to music. I mean, I'm 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 listening to the mamas and the papas type stuff. Like the new stuff is just I, I don't understand it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, it's you know it's just different. I mean, we we did a lot of uh, covers of like Almond Brothers and Crosby, Stills and Nash. You know, we had five part harmony. You know, you it's the kind of thing where you had to be able to do it. You couldn't fake it. Right. You know absolutely. You know, even with uh, even with some of the bands that came out later that you know, like KISS for example, um, where it's just a lot of noise and a lot of flash and a lot of it's a show. It's not about listening to music. You know, uh, when a guy gets up on the stage with an acoustic guitar and a microphone, you either bring it or you get off stage. You either have it or you're not there. Right. So, well, you know, well, back then, you had, actually, musicians. You, you had to have the talent back then. Now, it's if you're a pretty face, you're going to make it. I mean, back then, Africa, if you look at the lead singer of Africa or the, the music videos of Africa, you know, <laughs> that guy wouldn't would stand a chance today. Or, or even, you know, if you go to the beach, which I'm sure the Bee Gees at that time, 70s, everybody kind of looked like the Bee Gees, but now it's so much more on looks than it is sound. That, no, you know, that, sound that, was, that was MTV and VH1. They yeah. started, and Madonna, Madonna, you know, it started to be more about how you looked, how you danced, uh, right. how exciting it was, the, the adrenaline thing of it. And you weren't listening to the lyrics, you weren't, you know, it didn't make you think about anything. It was just a visceral experience. And right. that, that was that changeover, and it became a visual medium because of those uh, influences. There's nothing wrong with that, you know, but it kind of pushed out all the really creative people, I think, and yeah. put them on the, on the borders where you had to kind of search for that kind of music, you know. I think Jerry would agree with that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which I'm sorry, Jerry, that I hijacked and we went so, <laughs> so off topic. This is like everything else. We're the only four people left to talk about. There's some, there's some people hanging in there with us. <laughs> it's, it's like the other day, a Tim brought up the point in our chat saying how, like, how did we get on the top of cutting grass? <laughs> this is the statue show. So it, it seems that I keep making us go down that rabbit hole. So I apologize, Jerry. To no, no, that's all right. It's all right. Yeah, no, that's good. good. You know, as a young person, that you realize that, you see that. In music because you you're lucky because you've got this long history of great music that you can look back on. we didn't have it right. we had the 1950s which was you know Perry Como and Frank Sinatra who was a great singer by the way but we had it was a lot different and you know further back we went the, it got really uh, strange but you've right. got a long history that you can draw on of really cool, you know, cool music. Yeah. You should look into it. You know, every, I don't give any young person uh, the excuse not to understand the history of things that they might be into and how broad and how varied it is and how much more it can open up to them different avenues, you know, of creativity. So it's all there. It's right there on Google. Yeah. Couldn't be easier. <laughs> Spider is uh, saying I'm always exploring new holes. He's, he's so he's so right. <laughs> With the right amount of spit, any uh, hole. Oh my God, Art. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And now this show gets banned from YouTube. <laughs> So anyways, I want to just say thanks, you know, thanks to you guys for having me on. And it was fun. And I hope I answered the questions in a fantastic thanks for coming. Oh, yeah. oh, hundred percent. Like I mean, like we you would answer our questions and then we would go to a new level of stuff. So like I said, I, I really I, I thoroughly enjoyed you being on. Uh, I'm sure I ruined a lot of Jerry's questions because I hogged the mic because I kept getting that that tickle that I, I was like, I want to ask this question, this question, this question. So uh, I'm sorry, Jerry, but thank you, John. For, for yes, thank you very uh, much. You were fantastic, John. It was really it was really a pleasure Great and honor to have you on. Thanks for all the uh, you know comments and likes and everything on you know on the work and uh, anyone that I've done work for that's out there. Thank you. Can't thank you enough. Problem. Okay, so let's call that a wrap and uh, and we'll see all you guys next Friday. Sounds great. Later.